What's going on guys, this is Rob. Uh, if you guys enjoy my content, make sure you hit the subscribe button and make sure you hit that little bell so you never miss out on my sexy voice. So, by the time you guys are watching this video, I'll be in California, and I was trying to figure out what kind of content I was going to make this week, and so what you'll see down in the description is a temporary schedule for this week, um, and this is going to serve two purposes. The first is just to provide content for you guys. A lot of you all really, really loved Incredible Hulk, so I figured I'd just do like a lot of Incredible Hulk stuff. Specifically, we're going to be covering the entirety of the Planet Hulk event. The other half of this is to see whether or not you guys were watching Hulk videos because you just wanted to see him kill the superheroes. If you guys are genuinely interested in everything involving the Hulk, if you only cared about the origin of his son, it's really just a test to see what people are interested in, what they're not interested in, how many of you guys will watch the entire Planet Hulk versus just one single video. It's really just kind of an experiment on my part. You guys are my guinea pigs! <laughs> so I'm really just kind of experimenting here. But for those of you guys who saw the Planet Hulk animated series or who have looked up the story online or something like that, the first volume, I really like Exile, is kind of like the main story. Like that's the main Planet Hulk thing where he becomes a gladiator and he goes against the silver surfer that's the kind of thing we'll be covering here in this video the things that follow after that are all the the it's like one giant prologue uh, really that sets the stage for the world war hulk event for him coming back to earth um a lot of the stuff that we'll talk about in the prologue is really what's discussed during the uh, i guess during our videos on the origin of the incredible hulk son uh, the origin of scar now to lead into this proper to really get a i guess a firm grasp of what's going on um there was a prelude to this, but the prelude's not really necessary. The only thing we need to know is that there was a conflict whereby Bruce Banner had transformed into Joe Fixit. That's his gray form of the Incredible Hulk, and he had gone on a rampage in Las Vegas. And the result was that he did go against Ben Grimm. Uh, he did go against a few superheroes here and there in order that you know those individuals had tried to bring him back. The problem with this was that after the event was finished, the Fantastic Four and really the Earth superheroes had come to the realization that the Incredible Hulk uh, was just too impulsive. He was just too unpredictable to control. Control. Now, this was a decision that was largely made by the Illuminati. Now, in Marvel Comics, uh, in terms of chronology, the Illuminati, or I guess in terms of publication history, rather, the Illuminati are relatively new. They were a creation by Brian Michael Bendis, I think, and uh, they were a new introduction, but it was a retcon, a retroactive continuity, meaning that Brian Michael Bendis created the Illuminati and then wrote their stories in a way so that they had been here the entire time. They had been in existence uh, since the early days of Marvel Comics, and chronologically, they date all the way back to the Kree Scroll War. Now, we don't need to get into the depths of the Kree Scroll War, but suffice it to say, they're two alien races that have been fighting for millions and millions of years, and their conflict had eventually come close to the planet Earth. And because it stretched to the planet Earth, because it almost impacted the Earth, the decision was made by Reed Richards, by Doctor Strange, Black Bolt of the Inhumans, uh, Charles Xavier, uh, Iron Man, Tony Stark, to basically form a group among themselves to safeguard the planet Earth, and they would basically operate in secret. Nobody would know that they existed. Uh, the idea was that they would basically protect the earth from any threat that they found that was either you know from beyond the earth or within the earth itself now the kicker to all this is that in original sin we learned nick fury had already been doing this nick fury was the man on the wall the way these two things reconcile is that they didn't know about each other or at the very least nick fury knew about the illuminati but chose not to do anything but the illuminati did not know that nick fury was the man on the wall so this really shows how secretive nick fury was but the idea of the illuminati was to basically trick uh, the incredible hulk nick fury went to him with a scenario saying well in the cold War, there was a satellite that was launched by the Russians. It was supposed to be a spy satellite. Hydra had basically taken control of it. They had installed an artificial intelligence. That AI began to uh, evolve over the course of the last, you know, 50 years or however long it's been. And eventually it took over the uh, the satellite. The issue with this was that the satellite was designed for the purpose to detonate nuclear missiles. And so if this satellite's not destroyed, uh, Hydra can use it to detonate uh, nuclear weapons anywhere in the world and potentially lead to a worldwide crisis and really the extinction of humanity. And so what they did is they went to banner and said hey we need you to become the incredible hulk we need you to go to the satellite we need you to destroy it and then come back the kicker was that once he got up there while he did fight this artificial intelligence the entire situation turned out to be a ruse the illuminati tricked him onto the ship with the intention of sending him off to the far side of the galaxy away from the planet earth now we'll learn a little bit more about what their plan was but what greg pack did with this is he just immediately picked up with the conflict he immediately picked up with the incredible hulk's arrival now the incredible hulk ended up landing on a planet called sakar 
are. Now, as we know from our story of uh, the origin of the Incredible Hulk's son, the story of, uh, of Scar, we learned that these portals were created by an existing inhabitant on Sakaar for the purpose of bringing individuals to the planet that could basically cast off the ruling body of the Red King. They could cast them off from all their threats and allow the people to live in freedom. And so this is why the Incredible Hulk fell through this portal. It had already been generated and uh, he just ended up deviating into it just because of the fact that it had a gravitational pull. But once he arrives, uh, of course, the Incredible Hulk does what the Incredible Hulk does. He just starts tearing stuff up. And this is one of the reasons why I love the Incredible Hulk in this story is it's like it's like this uh, it's like he just radiates power, you know, and it's, it's like this hidden power that no one really seems to grasp. I don't know about you guys, but I love that concept. I love that ideology, that feeling when there's like a being present in a story and no one realizes how powerful they are. And you're just waiting like you're just you're just waiting for like you're just waiting for shit to pop off, basically, for things to just hit the fan. And it's like now everybody realizes how powerful he is. And people are like, oh, my God. God, he's powerful. Like, like that's that's the kind of thing I love in comic books. I absolutely, I, I adore that idea. Hopefully you guys do too. But when he arrives here, of course, he ends up going against the uh, indigenous species. And there really isn't much of a conflict here between those guys and himself. But after he arrives here, he's also set upon by the Imperial Guard of the Red King. And like all individuals who crash land on this planet, he is bound with an obedience disc. Now, uh, we're gonna go ahead and, and cheat a little bit. On, under normal circumstances, we would wait until that part of the story to get into but we can go ahead and cheat here and, and cover this a little bit. The obedience disc is a device that's planted on an individual and it quite literally interfaces with their brain, not in the sense of mind control, but in the sense that uh, they're basically bound to follow the obedience disc by fear of pain. And if they if they fight against the obedience disc too long, it'll basically fry their brain. It'll destroy every ounce of what makes them who they are and it'll just turn them into a mindless walking being. We'll actually see what happens with a few heroes or a few characters uh, when they fight their obedience disc too hard but almost immediately after hulk is bound with his disc he's taken to this sort of auction house to these gladiatorial games now what greg pack does here is he basically takes the traditional idea of roman society and gladiator games and folds them over into this now for those of you guys who don't know and i wouldn't call myself a history buff when it comes to the gladiatorial games in rome but i think i know enough that i can make a, a convincing explanation here a reasonable explanation here um the gladiatorial games existed in two forms one as a source of entertainment and two as a way to distract the roman people from the problems of Roman society. But the gladiatorial games were a huge event. I mean, it was a massive thing. It was like, it was like if the entire United States became involved in the Super Bowl, like everybody went to the Super Bowl. Like that's what the gladiatorial games were like. And it was just some of the best fighters from across all of Rome and all of its different territories. But it wasn't like every single fighter just went to the gladiatorial games. You had to work your way up. You had to start at the bottom at local gladiator competitions and then work your way to the very top to be in the gladiatorial games. And so again, it's much like the Super Bowl in the sense that you've got the regular season, then you've got the postseason. And so when it comes to uh, the Incredible Hulk here, of course, you know, when he's initially displayed before the Red King, the Red King's not really too surprised by what he sees uh, in terms of just the Hulk breaking out of his out of his ship. But what does impress the Red King is the ruthlessness of the Hulk. Now, right now at this moment, uh, this is not World Breaker Hulk. I mean, you know, Bruce Banner's mad, you know, Banner's pissed. He's very, very angry, but he's nowhere near the level that he will be with, with, with World War Hulk. It's insane how powerful he is during World War Hulk. But the very gist of this is that upon his initial arrival, he basically just starts taking two and uh, and ripping up these various foes that go against him. Now, he also encounters Meek for the very first time. Now, Meek will become a very important character with regards to uh, the Planet Hulk mythos. But, you know, uh, once Banner basically begins to realize what's going on, once he, you know, realizes that he's basically in a gladiatorial game, you know, once Meek Meek basically says, hey, you know, we're fighting for the enjoyment of the Red King and we're fighting for the enjoyment of the people. He realizes that the Red King is the one that's running the show here. And so Hulk's initial reaction is, all right, let's kill the Red King. Let's call it a day and then I can find a way to go home. But the Red King's guard, Kyra, immediately steps in. Now, as we know, she's going to be a, a major figure in the post-exile uh, landscape for the Planet Hulk event. But in this immediate moment right here, she's basically just the guard. She's basically like the top guard for the Red King himself. Now, there is a lot of history between the two of them. But initially the Red King says, no, 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 you know, do not take him out. I will fight the Incredible Hulk myself. Now this is 
cool to me because the Red King had no idea what he was going against. He didn't know the savagery of the Hulk. He didn't know the strength of the Hulk. And this proves itself in the sense that when the two go head to head, you know, Banner takes the sword and just slashes the Red King across the face. Now, this is an offense that would usually guarantee death uh, just because of the fact that whenever you deal with any monarchy in history, if anyone ever assaults the ruling person or the ruling family, they're almost immediately killed. But for the Red King himself, he also realizes the benefit that would come with the Incredible Hulk in the sense that if the Hulk is allowed to fight, the Hulk can draw a lot of people in. The Hulk can keep a lot of people distracted from the main war and the main rebellion the Red King has going on here, as well as the other plans that he has uh, taking place in the background. Of course, we'll learn more about that. But the idea here is that when the Hulk's guard is basically down, you know, he's suddenly attacked from behind by the Red King as Kyra tries to take him out, and uh, the Red King celebrates. Now, this is actually really important because what this does is this lays the groundwork for the relationship between Kyra and the Incredible Hulk in the sense that, you know, when she says, this is not your planet, he says, well, not yet. And as a person who's extremely honorable, who's honor bound to the Red King himself, Kyra is also a warrior at heart, and she realizes or recognizes another warrior as well. And so I wouldn't go as far as to say that the two have immediately fallen in love. I will say that with Greg Pak, the progress towards the two of them falling in love uh, is basically beginning with this first encounter. Now, from here, we sidetrack for a second, and we actually pick up with some highborn, or at least people who are part of a uh, part of the Imperial race that rules a planet. Now, when it comes to Sakaar, you have like an Imperial race, but not everybody is Imperial in the sense that they do not have the same rights and privileges as the existing Red King or any of his immediate surroundings, those individuals uh, that are part of his inner circle. Now, the reason behind this is because some of these individuals uh, do not believe in the Red King and they basically operate as rebels. Now, with the arrival of the Incredible Hulk, they look at him as the Sakarson, the son of Sakar, the man that is supposed to come to the planet and liberate them of their oppression. And so the idea here is for them to basically grab the Incredible Hulk, have him fight on their behalf, become part of the rebellion and cast off the Red King. Now, from here, we transition to a place called the Maw. Now, the Maw initially came off as a prison. That was my first thought when I saw it. But the Maw is actually like a proving ground. It is uh, a training ground for those individuals who are going to be part of the gladiatorial games. And this is why I say the Red King didn't immediately have the Incredible Hulk killed. Granted, he was hoping the Incredible Hulk would die here at uh, at the Maw. But the idea was that, you know, if he survives, then he'll go on to become part of the gladiatorial games. Now, the guy who's basically running the show here uh, was a former member of the gladiatorial games. He was a guy that fought in the gladiatorial games and worked his way to freedom. And the way this is done is you basically fight all the way to the top, you win three rounds, and then you're pardoned by the Red King. That's why this exists the way it does, because they're literally all fighting for their own individual freedom. Now, while this happens, or at least while they're in this maw, they're basically pit against one another, as well as some various forces that happen to be around there. And it's really just thinning the herd. I mean, that, that's that's really all Greg Pak is doing here. Greg Pak is saying, hey, there's like this huge population of prisoners in the maw, they're all going to fight each other, and then, you know, whoever's left, whoever's left alive, are going to be the ones that basically become like the gladiator team. And this is what happened. We basically have like, you know, this war bound being formed. We have the Incredible Hulk, we have Korg, we have Meek, we have LOA and a few others. We have Heroim. We have uh, basically these guys that come together as the last surviving seven. Now, the kicker to this is that they're not technically war bound yet. Within the realm of the Planet Hulk event, war bound is a pact that's made among warriors. Those individuals that would fight for one another to the death uh, in order to make sure that, you know, if they do die, they die well, they die with honor. Um, they would never sacrifice each other. They would never give up on one another. Um, they they basically hold the closest of allegiances. Now, this again is going to be a very important thing with World War Hulk because a lot of these guys actually travel back with him to World War Hulk. But this is really just, you know, initially all of them sitting down and saying, hey guys, let's have this big powwow. Let's tell our stories and let's, you know, let's make s'mores. And I love s'mores. Like, let's, <laughs> I get so distracted so easily. Hashtag ADD. So um, they're basically all just kind of like hanging out. They're, they're telling their own, individual stories. This is Greg Pak basically saying the Hulk does not consider himself to be a regular guy here. Now, this is actually really cool for the evolution of his character because for Bruce Banner being on this planet, all he's doing is just biding his time until he leaves. It's much like you saw with the animated series. There are some big differences, but this is one of the similarities in the sense that Banner does not see himself as a guy that's going to be here for the long haul. He doesn't see himself as a guy that needs to form alliances. You know, he's just kind of like, hey, look, we'll fight together if we have to, but when it comes down to it, if you guys die, I don't care. I just want to get off this planet. And so, what we do is we basically pick up with day two. Now day two gives us the, the former allies of Korg. The crazy thing about this is that Korg is one of several individuals uh, who had basically arrived on the planet forced here by one of those portals. While he basically operated as a man of his own individual will, so to speak, the other people that were alongside him basically fought against their obedience discs. And because of this, their brains were essentially fried.
Hawkeye. Now, when we saw in Planet Hulk uh, animated thing, this was part of the main gladiatorial games. In the story, that's not the case. They're still in training, basically. They're still in the Maw itself. And so, you know, where Korg does not initially want to find his allies, the Incredible Hulk says, hey man, get it together. You know, either you're going to fight here or you're going to die here. You know, these guys are mindless. They're not your friends anymore. As far as you're concerned, they're just dudes here that are in the way of you getting your freedom. And so because of this, Korg's basically able to pull it together and they officially become the A-team. They're, they're basically, I guess, Team A is kind of what they refer to, but they prove themselves in the Maw. And so at this point, it's really just small time gladiatorial games. It's really just small time things. You know, it's, it's small bits here and there where they basically prove their worth as capable fighters. And they successfully do that. You know, they're able to prove their worth. They're able to show that when it comes down to it, they have exactly what it takes to be legitimate gladiators. The other half of this is that the Red King is met with a conversation over their communication devices from Kyra. And she basically says, hey, look, the Incredible Hulk has people talking. You know, up until this point, it's been, well, maybe somebody will win, maybe they'll die. There's, you know, it's really been just more for watching the entertainment of people. But the Incredible Hulk is inspiring open rebellion. And the reason why is because those rebels who are out, out there on the fence, those rebels who were plotting, you know, to overthrow the, the Red King were waiting for their savior, you know, quote unquote, to come. And when he did, he came in the form of the Incredible Hulk. And so now they're far more brazen than they have been. And they're taking a lot more risks than they have been. Case in point, they basically break into the cells of the Incredible Hulk and the other gladiators. And they say, Hulk, come fight for us. You know, come, come fight on our behalf. Help us overthrow the Red King. Now, the funny thing about this is that Hulk says no. He says, no, 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 no. I don't want to have anything to do with this. Now, Hulk, as we know by this point, has a bigger plan. He has a more grandiose plan. But even then, you know, despite the fact that this is Hulk. He's not stupid. He doesn't have the brain of Bruce Banner, but he's still relatively intelligent at this point. And in his mind, he realizes that if they go with these guys in open rebellion, these rebels are not going to make it. These rebels are not going to survive. They're likely going to be captured or they're going to be killed, possibly even both. But the best way for the Incredible Hulk to gain his freedom and to kill the Red King is to work within the system. This is really kind of cool here because LOA sides with the rebels. And of course, she's taken prisoner by the Wildbots. And so the idea is, well, you know, maybe she's going to be killed. Maybe she's going to be cast out, no one really knows. Now, switching over to one of the other guys, what he basically says is, look, she's she's not going to be a survivor. And the reason why is because every single time a member of their race is taken by the Red King, they disappear. They basically just vanish into a black bag somewhere and no one knows where they go to. And so this is really just more of a uh, of a scenario where we're, we're essentially learning that the Red King is killing off anybody that could be legitimate competition. Now, from here, we have Greg Pak basically jumping back to the idea of Kyra herself and the uh, the romantic tension between herself and Bruce Banner. This is actually really kind of cool because, you know, I wouldn't say again that she's very much in love, but I would say that she looks at him as something better than he is. She looks at him as something great, something that could potentially lead into a much better future. Not only that, she basically says, hey, look, if you make it out of here alive, I wouldn't mind touching naughty bits a couple times. Uh, that's weird, but <laughs> you know, that's that's kind of where her character stands at the moment. And so what we do is we basically pick up with the Incredible Hulk and his Warbound in the big time games, in the great big huge deal here. Now, again, you know, for, for this part, this is really just them fighting their way through the ranks. They're proving to be capable, but this is really just them fighting their way through the ranks. The issue with this is that these wild bots they're going against are very, very capable in terms of taking people out. A lot of it being because of the fact that they went against the, uh, the spikes and the spikes, of course, will we'll talk about here in a little bit. That's a whole different kettle of beans. Uh, it's part of this grandiose plan that the Red King had to basically sort of put himself in power. But from here, they actually begin going about telling legitimate stories about themselves. They really delve more into who they are once this massive battle is finished and once they go back to their ranks or go back to their position as being gladiators. And we learn that for, you know, Korg, for example, uh, he had arrived on Earth and he had basically been challenged by Thor and Thor had used his hammer and single-handedly taken them all out. Uh, we know that with Bruce Banner, he actually reveals his backstory Story to them, tells them everything about himself. Um, again, this is really just them kind of coming together. And this is when they officially form themselves as a Warbound. Now, again, with the Warbound, what this means is that they are an official alliance now. It means that they will never give the other up. It means that no matter what happens, they will fight alongside each other and either they, they succeed, either they live together or they die together. But they'll never turn each other in and they'll never uh, assassinate or, or do anything to cut the other. Now, we're going to find some complications with this. But what we also learn here is that essentially the Silver Surf 
Surfer has been held captive or been, been taken by the Red King and is being held as their champion in the gladiatorial ring. Now, the funny thing about this is the Silver Surfer had just more or less been pushed into the situation, just sort of been, uh, just fell through that particular portal and arrived here and was immediately planted with an obedience disc. And so because of this, the Silver Surfer is also bound by this disc and forced to do the bidding of uh, the Red King as part of the Gladiator Games. And so this really leads us to this idea that the Incredible Hulk and his Warbound are basically at the top. They're on the cusp of reaching their freedom. All they have to do is defeat the reigning champion, the Silver Surfer. Now, when the Surfer appears here, no one else knows who he is. They don't know the significance of the Silver Surfer. Now, this is kind of ironic because for almost every organized civilization where the Silver Surfer appears, Galactus is soon to follow. Galactus is not far behind. That's why whenever a lot of societies see the Silver Surfer, they immediately panic and they just bail out. They just, they just jump in their ships and they vacate the planet because they know this is likely due to the fact that Galactus is coming to consume their planet. The fact that these guys don't know this is kind of ironic. In addition to this, the Silver Surfer, if he wasn't planted with this obedience disc, would just immediately obliterate all the forces here. He would basically annihilate every single last one of them. But the Incredible Hulk knows who the Silver Surfer is. Now, this actually goes all the way back to the days of Doctor Strange's Defenders, when the Incredible Hulk and the Silver Surfer fought side by side as allies. And so it's not like the Incredible Hulk's like, hey, I recognize that guy. I've seen him before. It's, I have fought alongside that guy. You know, I know who that guy is. He's a Silver Surfer. You know, if anybody can get us our freedom, it's him. Now, the Silver Surfer, of course, because he's bound by this obedience disc, immediately attacks the Incredible Hulk. You know, and, and this is kind of funny because Banner says, well, you're just like all of them. Now, this again shows us the psychotic state of Bruce Banner, the fact that he's really more irrational than anything else. Because remember, in his heart of hearts right now, he's swearing vengeance against the Illuminati. Right now, he's just mad. You know, right now, he's just angry. Like, they screwed me over. They cheated me. You know, I'll get revenge on them at some point along the line. Now, we'll learn that the plan of Bruce Banner actually changes, you know, after the events that are getting ready to happen here. But in his mind, he's still angry at the Illuminati because he feels like he's been tricked. What's happening right here, this small scene with the Silver Surfer attacking the Incredible Hulk, this is the story of his life. The Incredible Hulk makes friends. The friends of Incredible Hulk turn on him. And then the Incredible Hulk goes into hiding and refuses to trust those friends again. Except you replace those friends with humanity and a multitude of heroes. And it's the Hulk's life over and over and over again. Now, a lot of times this is due to the fact that the Hulk just didn't understand what was going on, didn't grasp the full context of the situation. But in his mind right now, you know, he's like, the Silver Surfer is attacking me. The Silver Surfer is just like everybody else. And so because of this, he immediately takes it to the Silver Surfer. Now, this is kind of cool here because what Greg Pak is telling us is that one-on-one, -on -one, when it comes to sheer strength, the unbridled strength of the Incredible Hulk is dominant over the Silver Surfer. But the other half of this is we also have to kind of ask the question, if the Silver Surfer wanted to, could he take out the Incredible Hulk? The answer to that question is unequivocally yes. <laughs> now, if it's World War Hulk, that poses a different question because World War Hulk is very, very capable in terms of his durability, his strength, but it requires that he gets his hands on the Silver Surfer. So the Silver Surfer could just kind of, you know, stay out of arm's reach and just constantly bombard him with cosmic energy. And eventually the Incredible Hulk would probably be killed. But at the very least, in this, in the context of this situation, the Incredible Hulk is just lashing. I mean, just tearing into the Silver Surfer. Now, this is about as close as he gets to World Breaker Hulk during the Planet Hulk event. This is about as close as he gets to being as strong as he was during the World War Hulk event. But it's also kind of ironic here because the more he loses it and the more that he pummels the Silver Surfer, the more terrified people become because of how powerful he is. And the reason why is because the only context that these viewers, these, these citizens have had with regards to the strength of the Silver Surfer is the fact that he's beaten everybody up to this point. And so the Incredible Hulk rising up to this level, no one ever had any idea of just how strong he was. But the fact that he's able to beat the reigning champion into submission and into the extreme is mind-blowing. And so because of the fact that the Silver Surfer is essentially defeated, the Warbound and the Incredible Hulk say, look, we've we've played your game. We won your game. Give us our freedom. But what happens is Kyra basically uses the instance of the Incredible Hulk slashing the face of the Red King to say, okay, you have one final test. And your final test is to kill Eloway and the other rebels who tried to stand against the Red King. Now, the kicker to this is that Kyra kind of knows how this is going to play out to a degree. She knows that there are members of the Warbound who are not going to kill Eloway. They don't want to kill one of their own. Even if Eloway had walked out, they still have honor for her as an honorable fighter. And so they refuse to kill her. In response to this, the idea is either you kill her or you're going back and you're going to be in the gladiatorial games until you do. They would literally just keep her around, keep her alive, 
until the Incredible Hulk and his Warbound were willing to kill her, otherwise they would just stay in the gladiatorial games. But in response to this, because of the fact that the Incredible Hulk had destroyed the obedience disc of the Silver Surfer and no one had noticed, the Silver Surfer uses his power cosmic to destroy the obedience discs on the chest of everybody in the entire kingdom. This is kind of the kicker because what this tells us is this is how the Red King's been maintaining his power. The Red King has not been maintaining his power through loyalty. He's been maintaining his power through force. Now, there, there are individuals like Hyera, you know, who do not have obedience discs planted on her just because of the fact that she does willingly swear absolute allegiance to him because she's honor bound to do so. And we'll find out why later on. But the gist behind this is with all these people free, the question is, well, what do we do now? I mean, we have freedom. Like, what do we do? And the Incredible Hulk says, well, we do the only thing that makes sense. We just start ripping shit up. <laughs> And that's what the Incredible Hulk does. You know, he alongside the other guys tear down the gladiatorial stadium and they basically say, we're free, let's go. They basically walk away. Now, initially the Silver Surfer says, hey man, if you want, I can take you back to Earth. And the Incredible Hulk says, no, I'm staying here. I've, I've basically found a place that I can call my own because the Incredible Hulk looks at the world that he's in right now. He looks at the situation that he's in and he says, hey, look, I can basically form a life for myself. You know, if those guys on Earth don't trust me, you know, then fine, I'll just stay here and I'll make this world mine. You know, I will operate outside of them. I have followers. I have people who trust me, people who are honor bound to me. The Incredible Hulk has found more loyalty here on Sakaar than he's ever found over the course of his life on Earth. And so for him, there's no reason to go back. I am not a patient man. I've never been a patient man. I've, I've never had patience. From the time that I was a little kid up until right now, when I want something, I don't want it now. I want it right now. Like, I don't, I don't, I don't like waiting. I hate waiting on things. And I've been reading through Planet Hulk and I was like, hmm, I can't wait to do World War Hulk. So I was like, you know what we're gonna do? We're just gonna cover like everything in this video on Planet Hulk. We're gonna cover all the rest of the stuff. That way we can jump into World War Hulk because World War Hulk is stupidly good. Um, it is, it's insane how good it is. So uh, following the events of our first video, really like the first volume, the Planet Hulk event really began to, it was really Greg Pak taking this traditional standard on a multi-part series in the sense that um, you really had like, uh, in the beginning, you, you basically have the stage being set. That's usually how the first story arc goes. It sets the stage, it says, hey, here's the status quo. Um, and then there will be some kind of major conflict. And what that conflict will do is it will eliminate the existing status quo and it will begin a transition to the new status quo. And that's exactly what happened in our first video, you know, to, to kind of provide a little bit of a refresher there. With the first video, it was really just the Incredible Hulk being sent away from the planet Earth by the Illuminati because he was deemed to unpredictable. He crash landed on Sakaar. He was basically press ganged into the gladiatorial games and then eventually rose up against the Red King alongside the Silver Surfer. Now, the kicker about all this is that following the Incredible Hulk, uh, essentially defeating the immediate armies of the Red King and going out into Sakaar proper, he of course had his warbound, Korg and uh, Alloway and so on. But the idea was that his actions had inspired open rebellion among everybody else, like all these slaves from across the planet uh, who were subservient to the Red King had looked to the Incredible Hulk as an example of the fact that they could attain their own freedom, whether it was through force or otherwise. And so in response to this, the Red King did the only thing he knew how to do. The Red King used force in order to try to maintain his control. Now, the cool thing about all this was that Kyra, his shadow, a member of the Old Strong, didn't really know the full spectrum of everything that had been going on. Instead, from her mind, she was a child being groomed to understand how the old power worked, uh, to be you know, being groomed to understand what her place was going to be as a warrior among her own group. The issue with this was that at some point along the line when she was a young girl, the spikes had suddenly attacked uh, her village and it resulted in the Red King basically, uh, you know, allowing the conflict to take place and then turning around and finding out who she was and then taking her as his own. Now, what Greg Pak's doing here is Greg Pak is using a really cool instance of something called game theory. And it works out really, really well with regards to this story. So game theory is, is literally just using like mathematical probability to determine the logical action that people will take. Uh, a really good example of this, or I guess in this particular instance, he's using something as like a leader. So um, to, to sidetrack for a second and bear with me here, because this may seem kind of out of left field, but let's say that like you're the leader of a territory, right? Let's say you're like the leader of uh, the United States of whatever your name is. <laughs> the United States of Comics Explained. Let's say you're the leader of the United States of Comics Explained and you learn 
that another country is going to attack you. Well, you have three options that are available to you. You can let the attack happen, you can stop the attack beforehand, or you can attack them before they attack you. Now, the idea here is under normal circumstances, attack them before they attack you or defend against the attack, make preparations uh, to keep your people safe. But if you did either of those, it would alert the enemy to what it is that you're doing. And so what you can do is you can let the attack happen. And then in turn, your people will rally under you. It's, it's one of the concepts of, of game theory. But the idea here is that the Red King did exactly that. The Red King had a motive here. The Red King was a child. He was an emperor. He wasn't really viewed as being someone that could be an effective leader. And so what he needed was someone at his side that could basically maintain the level of protection that he needed, but could also allow him to uh, have others look to him as a legitimate leader. And by going to one of the oldest races in the entirety of Sakaar's history and essentially allowing an attack on their group to happen, and then turning around and capturing the strongest of them, it forged an allegiance by force as opposed to, you know, diplomacy or something like that. But the basis behind this entire revelation was that Kyira had learned that the spikes were implemented by the Red King himself. It wasn't as though the spikes had simply just arrived in her village and attacked her. This had been orchestrated by the Red King. Now, something else to point out here is the Red King did not engineer the spikes. Instead, within the Marvel Universe, the spikes existed as basically like a, a sentient organism, and they literally just fed on cosmic energy. They would just traverse the spaceways, and they would feed on energy. The problem with this was that during the rule of the Red King's father, the spikes had landed and then were eventually eliminated or removed from the planet by the Red King's father. They were essentially sent to the moon. The problem with this is that while they stayed in stasis for some time, and they ended up turning to cannibalism in order to survive, the Red King harnessed the spikes for his own uses, and the Red King basically used the spikes to essentially get rid of communities uh, that had worked against him, to get rid of communities that were not functioning the way that he wanted them to, or not uh, recognizing his rule as being legitimate. But in learning about this, Kyra had effectively turned against the Red King. She had turned against him, realizing that he was not an ally, that he was an enemy, that the lengths that he was willing to go to to try to defeat those who were standing against him was of such an extreme that he was actually willing to wipe out all life on the planet if it meant that nobody would challenge him. And so because of this, because of the fact that he was so extreme, because he was so dangerous, because of the fact that he had basically destroyed her people, Kyra had turned against the Red King and allied herself with the Incredible Hulk. And so what happened is Kyra, alongside the Hulk, as well as the remnants of the Warbound, basically went through and cut a swath, and I know you guys, <laughs> I know you guys love it when I say that, cut a swath through the uh, entirety of the Red King's army, eventually leading to his defeat. Now, in this original story, the way Greg Pak did it, it was presumed that the Red King had been killed. But of course, as we learned with regards to the uh, the origin of Scar himself uh, as the Incredible Hulk's son, now the Red King didn't die. The Red King instead was basically beaten to the edge of death and then eventually brought back by his own uh, wild bots. But what the story does, what these events do is they effectively pick up with the Incredible Hulk alongside Kyra, uh, essentially creating their own way and, uh, and forming their own kingdom and the remnants of the Red King's rule. Now, the funny thing about this is with the Incredible Hulk and Kyra, they're almost one in the same in terms of how they view things in the sense that Kyra has been raised to be a warrior. And so she's the very definition of a warrior. In truth, she's really more akin to Thor than anybody else. But in the confines of this particular story, um, she wants peace to a degree, but she's also, you know, has no qualms killing those that get in her way. And the Incredible Hulk is the exact same way. But the other half of this coin is that when the Incredible Hulk first showed up on Sakaar as part of the Planet Hulk event, he wanted to leave. He didn't want to have anything to do with these guys here. He didn't want to have anything to do with forming a war bound or, or basically leading the inhabitants to salvation. But the way this worked is that he was viewed as essentially being the Sakarson. That is to say, basically the savior of Sakar. Uh, whenever he bled, it ended up growing plants on the surface. And so it really allowed the civilizations that were here to look at him as uh, quite literally their messianic figure, a guy that was going to lead them into a much greater tomorrow. Now, eventually the Incredible Hulk actually takes this role on alongside with Kair, and he basically looks at himself as a king with her as his queen. More so than that, he's also met with Meek. Now, the cool thing about this when it comes to Meek's character is he had basically helped some of his people who had been held captive to escape uh, into freedom, but in the process had actually undergone this transformation, basically making him the king and allowing him to uh, get with their queen and do what they do in order to create offspring. Um, the queen's not much to look at, but <laughs> it works within the confines of their own race here. But the other half of this is that they're very much in the middle of cleaning up here. They're very much in the middle of uh, getting everything sorted out. Now, with regards to the conversation between the Incredible Hulk and Kyra, this is why I say it's such an important part of his character is because when he takes her and they go on somewhat of a journey where they go to basically like the steps of Sakaar, which is this sort of proving ground slash, you know, peaceful, uh, harmonic place, the two of them begin to talk. And the Incredible Hulk says that all he was bred for is to 
destruction. I mean, when, when the Incredible Hulk existed on Earth, all he did was just destroy things. Now, again, a lot of this was because the Incredible Hulk wanted to be left alone, but it didn't change the fact that the Incredible Hulk always was destructive by nature, hence the reason he was sent away by the Illuminati. Whenever he looks at the entire history of his time on Sakaar, he looks at the events as they've unfolded throughout the entire Planet Hulk event. All he sees is a continuation of the pattern that he had on Earth, and that wherever he goes, destruction will follow him. But Kyra looks at him and says, this is not the case. You know, when you bleed, it grows plant life, and look at the life that you've created. He's basically restored the planet. He's in the process of terraforming the planet just because of his blood. And so what he's done is he's given all the civilizations on Sakaar hope. He's given them a future to look forward to. And because of this, his life, while on Earth he may very well have been a force of destruction, on Sakaar, he's a savior in every ounce of the word. Now, this is huge for the Incredible Hulk. And this is why Greg Pak's writing of Planet Hulk is so good, because we've never really seen an instance like this. It's one of the reasons why I love the Incredible Hulk. We'd never seen him written in such a way to where he was more of a savior than a destroyer. Now, a lot of that was because of the fact that, you know, within the confines of his role on Earth, he was just kind of a bumbling buffoon that was, it was, he was a bull in a china shop. It's really the best way to describe the Incredible Hulk on Earth. And it worked in a lot of situations because we got to see him go against some various, you know, heroes and, you know, even more so with villains, it was kind of like, well, if things aren't going our way, call on the Hulk, he'll solve our problem, then we'll send him away. Uh, it was, it was really interesting in how it was done, but it didn't add a lot of character depth. The most depth we ever really got it was during Peter David's run when it came to the Incredible Hulk's history, his abusive father, so on and so forth, and why the Hulk persona manifested when Banner was blasted with gamma rays, but that was about it. There was really no huge exploration into his character. The cool thing about this, though, is that we get that in this story. We get so much depth with regards to the Incredible Hulk, you know, I guess to such an extreme, that he actually changes his tune. You know, he tells Kyra, yeah, you're right. You know, I am a savior here. I am a person here that can literally lead all these different races to a much better tomorrow. And so he, alongside Kyra and everybody else here, begins the process of cleaning up, begins the process of getting things sorted out. Now, what we also learn is that there is some trouble in paradise. You know, there are individuals that look at the Incredible Hulk, LOA especially, and says, he's not that different from the Red King. The Red King used us as slaves to build his kingdom, and it seems like the Incredible Hulk's doing the same thing. Now, we as the reader know this is not the case. All we know is that the Incredible Hulk is just making them apply a little bit of elbow grease, and that it's really one of these situations where everybody has to chip in in order to make everything better. You know, it's not something where the Incredible Hulk can just fix everything. More so than that, there's a reward to this. You know, once they finish uh, rebuilding, once they finish clearing all this debris out, once they finish restructuring and making the kingdom their own, they can sit back at their handiwork and say, this is ours. You know, something earned is far more significant than something given. And so the idea here is that they're effectively earning their place in this kingdom. They're earning the right to say, we made this, as opposed to, well, we just toppled the Red King, everything stayed intact, and then we just occupied the kingdom. It really establishes them as being part and parcel to this entire area itself. And so from here, we really have this kind of conclusion with regards to the idea of the spikes. And this really just kind of ties in. It's really just Greg Pak, you know, eliminating these last few things in the sense that these various spike ships that had been confined to the moon uh, that hadn't quite been harnessed by the Red King, this ultimately led to the Incredible Hulk traveling to the moon and freeing all the spikes and allowing them to go back about their business, uh, traversing the spaceways. And so it's literally just kind of him fulfilling these last few packs, fulfilling these last few agreements, you know, solidifying the fact that the Incredible Hulk is a true, legitimate, and benign leader over the people in, uh, in Sakaar. The problem with this is that as they begin to celebrate, once everything begins to get put together, you know, once everything begins to come back to normal, we suddenly find that this is the ship or the shuttle that the Incredible Hulk had been brought in begins to start beeping. Now, the idea was to turn this shuttle into somewhat of a monument, to basically make it a testament to the fact that the Incredible Hulk had been sent here as a Sakarsan. He had uh, liberated them all and ushered them into freedom. And because of the fact that this thing starts beeping, we basically learn that this is a warp core meltdown, that the nuclear core of this ship is beginning to break down, it's beginning to detonate. And so the Incredible Hulk does what he can to try to protect those around him, you know, especially Kyra, who's currently pregnant with her child. But the result is that there's really nothing he can do. This nuclear powered, really bomb, for lack of a better word, uh, essentially explodes and it destroys all everything in the Crown City, everything and almost everyone. The only people who aren't killed here are those individuals, those people who are part of his warbound, uh, Heroim, Korg, those people who are basically sent away from the Crown City in order to begin the process of creating diplomatic ties with other civilizations, other tribes around the planet in order to ensure that they, uh, you know, that they don't really recognize the Incredible Hulk as their king so much as they see him as the new ruler of Crown City and someone with which they can have diplomatic relations with. And so because the 
they're not currently present, they become aware of what's going on. They realize that the Crown City has been destroyed in a nuclear blast, but for them, they don't know why. They don't really understand why. But the more important thing about this is Greg Pak is setting the stage here. With the Incredible Hulk as a character, and this, this is one of the reasons why I loved the, the end of Planet Hulk so much, because this, this is why I say there's so much development. With the Incredible Hulk as a character, all he's known is disappointment. I mean, that's the story of his life. Let down after let down. Superheroes claim to be his friends, and then they betray him. Villains use him for their own ends. Humanity is constantly hunting him down. The Incredible Hulk's life was just nothing but a sad tale. You know, Bruce Banner's father was an extremely abusive man, you know, more so to the point that is believed that Bruce Banner himself developed multiple personalities. And so when he was blasted with the Gamma Bomb that led to the formation of the Incredible Hulk, the Incredible Hulk is just the physical manifestation of his anger towards his father, his rage against humanity, you know, his hatred against all things or anything that would try to do harm against Banner himself. It's really like a physical manifestation of his psychological desire to stay protected from everything in the world that would harm him. And so the idea is that leaving Earth and being sent on Sakaar for the first time gave the Incredible Hulk purpose. It gave him a place that he believed he can call his own. And the Incredible Hulk says this, you know, he says, look, when I was here, I thought I had a place. I, I believed this could be something real. I believed it could be something true. I believed that I could really look out onto the horizon of a rising sun and see a better tomorrow. But he says, I was foolish to believe this. I was foolish to believe that I would find anything but death and destruction everywhere I go. Now, as we know with our origin story of Scar, this was the moment whereby Kyra had basically sent her unborn son uh, into the planet in order to basically be saved from the presumed destruction of, uh, of Sakaar, and he would uh, essentially emerge. And so these last few moments of the Incredible Hulk on this planet are around the time that his son is emerging and beginning to come into his own in terms of encountering these various species and so on uh, that are you know part of the planet itself, part of the indigenous life. But then suddenly the Incredible Hulk is also met with the remainder of his warbound, with Korg, Heroin, Meek, so on. And initially the Incredible Hulk wants to be left alone because he's quite literally a grieving guy here. But as we know with the stages of grief, at first it's denial. It's denial of the fact that those individuals around that, that we lose are dead. It's the idea, well, you know, somehow something will happen, things will change, we can get things back to the way they were before. After that, it leads to anger. And this is the Incredible Hulk angry. This is him about as mad as he's ever going to be. And so he, alongside with his warbound, prepare. They prepare for an invasion of Earth. They begin the process of forming arms and armament for a full-on invasion and destruction of those who did the Incredible Hulk harm. And so in effect, at the beginning of World War Hulk, the end of the Planet Hulk storyline, what we have here is Bruce Banner with the wrath of God. It is... <laughs> God, is a sight to behold. <laughs> Dude, I almost want to just like crank out World War Hulk right now. Like, ugh, like this, this is, man, this is, <laughs> oh, can you guys feel it? Can you feel the excitement? Like this is, this, I love this story so much because really Planet Hulk is just like one giant prelude to World War Hulk. But at the same time, like, I was in the Incredible Hulk's corner the entire event. I mean, let's let's have this little bit of a discussion about World War Hulk for a second. I was in the Incredible Hulk's corner with regards to World War Hulk. I was in his side because I was like, yeah, man, like humanity's done nothing but dick you over, Incredible Hulk. Let's get some revenge, dude. Let's kill some folks. Let's go ahead and remind humanity of their place in the bigger picture. Like, let's remind them where they stand because it's not on an even playing field with you, man. Like, I was, <laughs> I was like, let's do this. But uh, because I'm so hyped, we're going to go ahead and cover World War Hulk. Uh, in the next video. We'll go ahead and just kick off World War Hulk. But uh, but yeah, guys, like I really hope you all enjoy this Planet Hulk series so far. Um, There are a few things here and there that we didn't really cover. I know there's going to be some people who want some of that stuff covered. We may or may not do that at a future point in time, but in truth, it wasn't really relevant to the story per se. Um, It was really just something we could kind of gloss over and then get to the meat and potatoes of Planet Hulk, because I kind of think the stuff that we ran over in this video was far more significant in terms of the development of the Hulk, because again, my aim here was to basically show you guys the evolution of Bruce Banner from being sent to Earth, residing on Planet Hulk, Hulk, the things he gained and then in turn lost, and why he's so angry and why he ends up coming back to uh, Earth and literally waging a one-man war against the superheroes of the planet. Members of the Rob Corps, we are here. 
World War Hulk. Now, I, I gotta admit, I was kind of on the fence about this. I was like, ah, do I really wanna do World War Hulk? I mean, this is before I even launched the Planet Hulk thing because I'd been experimenting with like Red Hulk and that kind of thing. And a lot of guys really, really seem to enjoy it. So I figured why not just kind of go back from the beginning from basically Planet Hulk and move forward up through the chronology leading us into Red Hulk. So here's what we're gonna do. Uh, for the rest of this week, really until we finish the World War Hulk event, which should probably take us about a week or so. It should take the rest of this week anyway, uh, going into like Saturday. World War Hulk is going to take the place of everything except DC Rebirth. So we're going to keep all the DC Rebirth stuff, but like uh, classic Marvel, classic DC. Well, I think we might keep classic DC and do like speeding bullets or something like that, where Superman becomes Batman. Aside from that, like, you know, how to kill superheroes, things like that. Uh, the all new, all different Marvel day. Um, that's all just going to be World War Hulk because it'll give us a chance to get caught up really, really fast and then turn around and go back to doing one Hulk video a week, you know, leading up to the launch of Hulk and all new, all different Marvel. So anyway, uh, so World War Hulk is is kind of like this coup de gras, right? It's, it's like, it's the magnum opus. It's the, the final event of Greg Pak's run on the Incredible Hulk. And we know that because after World War Hulk was over, it was essentially Hercules taking up the mantle of Incredible Hulk, where it was really just like, it was like the Incredible Hercules. Hercules being put into the role that would normally be played by the Incredible Hulk. Now that was done just because of the fact that Hercules just never really had a place in Marvel Comics. And so Marvel was doing the best they could to give him a place to stay. The issue is that it didn't last very long. And a lot of people didn't really like it too much. It had some cool stories like Chaos War, which is insanely awesome. But aside from that, uh, there wasn't really a whole lot to go with there. But World War Hulk initially opens up with the uh, North American Aerospace Defense Command Outpost, which is actually in Cheyenne. And this is really cool because, of course, uh, when we when we had our, our Planet Hulk event, our Planet Hulk story, at the conclusion of that, we had talked about how the Incredible Hulk had taken a ship with his warbound and basically moved or made his uh, made his way towards the planet Earth. And this is them essentially just realizing that the Incredible Hulk is coming. Now, initially, they don't know it's the Incredible Hulk. Instead, they just know that it's a ship. Now, the issue with this is that it begs a lot of questions with regards to, um, you know, how people don't know it's the Incredible Incredible Hulk. For example, in Marvel Comics, they have an organization called SWORD, the Sentient World Observation and Response Department. And this is literally just an organization that monitors other worlds. Now, because it monitors other worlds for, you know, potential threats, it may not have just, it, it just simply may not have registered the fact that the Incredible Hulk was there or they didn't care. They just simply saw a ship. But you would think that with a ship of unknown origins heading towards the planet, Earth, that somebody would stop to ask a question and say, hey, does anybody know what's going on with that ship right there? Because it's big and it's heading here and we don't know what's on it. So, you know, <laughs> the fact that that didn't happen begs a few questions, but at the very least, it was just for the sake of storytelling. Um, but the fact remains here that we essentially pick up on the moon, the blue area of the moon. Now, this is a big deal because what this does is this ties into the existing chronology of the Inhumans back before, uh, well, really back before all new, all different Marvel. Uh, with the Inhumans, during Paul Jenkins' run of the Inhumans, event, which was like, you know, in Human Volume 2 or Volume 3, I think, uh, this was essentially a set of events whereby Black Bolt had orchestrated a massive uh, duping. He had basically just duped <laughs> the Inhumans and tricked them into leaving Earth and going to the blue area of the moon. And that's where the Inhumans have been the entire time. Now, for those of you guys who don't know, the blue area of the moon is this oxygen-rich part of the moon. It's literally a section of the moon where you can walk around without any measure of protection and you can breathe just fine. Uh, it's actually a huge talking point in Marvel. Like, a lot of people have been there. A Apocalypse has been there when he kidnapped uh, Nathan Summers, who went on to become Cable. Or the X-Men have visited there a multitude of times. Um, it's, it's a huge staging ground, like a huge battleground in the history of Marvel's publications. They always return there in some form or fashion. But the Incredible Hulk coming here is due to the fact that Black Bolt was part of the Illuminati. Because remember, he's waging a war against the Illuminati here. Now, with regards to Black Bolt, his voice, his quasi-sonic scream, uh, has varied over time in terms of how strong it is in Marvel Comics. There's been times where it's been shown capable of destroying planets. There's been times when it's only shown capable of destroying like a small satellite, like a small planet or a small moon or something like that. In this instance, his voice is, if I recall correctly, is kind of in the middle of the ground where it's not strong enough to destroy a planet, but it is strong, strong enough to destroy a moon. Now, when I say his voice is in the middle ground, I mean, if you were to just kind of whisper or talk at a normal rate, regardless of what writers do or regardless of where he's been at in his publication history, if Black Bolt were to scream as loud as possible, he would wipe out a planet. I mean, it's, it's always been that way. Like, if he screams as loud as he can, that planet will be destroyed. With the Incredible Hulk being here, as soon as he shows up, you know, when he tells Black Bolt, like, dude, I'm gonna take you out. <laughs> like, I'm, I'm going to destroy you. Black Bolt simply just kind of whispers enough. And it's a it, it does enough to basically damage, you know, the Incredible Hulk, or at the very least, it seems like it does enough to damage the Incredible Hulk. But then we learn in one of the most awesome scenarios possible, the Incredible Hulk says, I didn't come here to hear you whisper. I came here to hear you scream. 
game. And I was like, this is so badass because it's just the way it's done. It's just, it's insane how cool this looks. So uh, from here, it's, it's essentially the scenario where the government begins to become aware of the fact that something bad is happening. Not only that, they have literally chunks of the moon just breaking away from orbit. And so their question is what in the hell is going on on the moon? That there's a conflict so massive that it's sending chunks of the moon into space itself. Now, one other thing to keep in mind here, and, and this is something that we'll touch on a little bit more as we get into this, but Tony Stark is currently the director of S.H.I.E.L.D. This is after Civil War. This, this picks up relatively soon after the conclusion of Civil War. So we still have the initiative, the 50 state initiative, where we have a superhero team in all 50 states. Not only that, of course, we still have the Illuminati as we knew them before. And so it's essentially the scenario where the world is coming to the realization that the Incredible Hulk is, is about to unleash hell. And this happens when the Incredible Hulk broadcasts himself to the world. And what he does is he essentially tells the story of what the Illuminati are. Now, keep in mind, again, the Illuminati always operated behind the scenes. No one ever knew who they were. No one even knew they existed. The only people that were aware of the Illuminati were the Illuminati themselves. Now, this all changed, really. They came to light uh, during both this World War Hulk event and even more so during the events of Jonathan Hickman's Avengers and New Avengers when they were basically public enemy number one in the eyes of Steve Rogers as the director of S.H.I.E.L.D. But the idea here is that the Incredible Hulk's essentially saying, you call the Illuminati heroes, you call Mr. Fantastic, you call Iron Man, Black Bolt of the Inhumans, Doctor Strange, you call them humans, they shot me into space. They didn't give me a trial, they didn't give me, you know, they didn't give me a chance to, to make any kind of case for myself. Instead, they duped me onto a satellite, and then I got into a ship, they sent that ship, you know, across the galaxy, I ended up in a, you know, going through a wormhole, ended up on this planet called Sakaar, that was literally a war world, and the result was that, you know, while I did form a bond with what the Hulk refers to as this warbound, the fact remains that he found a life for himself, but then a bomb went off because of the ship as it was designed by the Illuminati, which resulted in him losing everything he had. And so he gives them an ultimatum. And this is really cool because what the Incredible Hulk is going to do is he's going to turn New York City into a gladiatorial arena. It's badass when he does this. He says, you have 24 hours to hand over Reed Richards, Doctor Strange, and Iron Man, or I'm going to do this to every single person that I find. And he literally holds up Black Bolt. Now, the, the kicker about this, this is what's kind of ironic, is that not everyone knows about Black Bolt. Again, this really changed during Jonathan Hickman's Infinity Event when Black Bolt had detonated the Terrigen Bomb and basically caused the Terrigen Mist to spread across the world, waking up in humans everywhere. But the fact that one of Earth's superheroes has basically been ripped to shreds by the Incredible Hulk, been pummeled to the point where he's been absolutely obliterated is an indication that the Incredible Hulk is not screwing around. Now, again, keep in mind here, despite the fact that Hulk is talking with a calm voice, despite the fact that Hulk is talking with a calm, relaxed tone, he's pissed. I mean, he's insanely angry. Now, he's not as angry as he's going to be at the end of the story, but at this moment right now, the Incredible Hulk is a force to be reckoned with. The other half of this equation is with Tony Stark being the director of S.H.I.E.L.D., he immediately takes off. He says, okay, fine, we've got to, we've got to find some way to deal with this. We've got to find some way to cope with the Incredible Hulk, because if we don't, he is going to tear everybody apart. Not only that, the idea is maybe we can rationalize with him. Maybe we can talk him down. Maybe we can figure out what it is that's going on. And so what happens is Doctor Strange initially appears to Tony Stark and says, hey, look, we need to have a contingency plan. In case things go south, we need to have someone that can basically fight on our behalf or at the very least can go toe-to-toe -to -toe against the Hulk. And so what they do is they go and they visit Robert Reynolds. Now, Robert Reynolds historically has, his powers have kind of fluctuated. His powers have kind of changed. You know, I have videos on him. If you guys want to, you're welcome to check those videos out. But the underlying theme here is that Robert Reynolds is one of the few characters in the Marvel Universe that can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Incredible Hulk that can stand against him. And so the idea of the Illuminati is to have uh, Robert Reynolds come to their aid, come to their side and fight on their behalf. The issue with this is that Robert Reynolds is actually not going to do that. Now, from here, we pick up with some of the minor minor superheroes, really not minor, but in terms of like overall strength, in terms of abilities, uh, minor characters. We of course have uh, uh, Spider-Man, we have uh, She-Hulk stepping into the fray and they're really not fighting here so much as they're helping to orchestrate this mass evacuation of New York City. Because again, you know, when the, the Incredible Hulk showing back up here terrifies the hell out of everybody. Not just because it's the Incredible Hulk, but again, because he has the strength to level the entirety of New York City. And so what we do is we basically switch over to uh, to Iron Man Tony Stark. Now again, he's meeting with Luke Cage, he's meeting with Doc Samson, She-Hulk, Wonder Man, Simon Williams. I mean, a lot of these heroes that cannot just 
absolutely cannot go go toe to toe with the Incredible Hulk. And he basically says, hey, look, you know, he's he's going to come here, you know, but when he does, I'm not going to let him just walk all over us. I'm going to fight him. You know, I'm going to do what I can to hold off the Incredible Hulk. Now, again, Tony Stark has his Hulk buster armor. And this is this is really, really important because there have been a couple moments in the, the Marvel Comics storylines when we've seen the Incredible Hulk go against Hulk buster. This one and Original Sin. Original Sin, I think, did it much, much better in the sense that the Incredible Hulk was at about the same level as he is right now during his World Breaker Hulk form. And the idea was that he basically mocked Tony Stark. You know, Tony Stark went against the Incredible Hulk in Original Sin with his uh, Hulk Buster armor, and Hulk just kind of laughed at him and said, you know, his, his toys, you know, Tony Stark always has his toys and they're always amusing, but they don't stand a chance against the Incredible Hulk. And that's exactly what happens here. Try as he might, the Hulk Buster armor is able to hold things out for a while. Tony Stark is able to do reasonably well against the Incredible Hulk. The issue with this is that when it all comes down to it, Tony Stark just doesn't have it. Tony Stark just does not have the ability to hold on to it. Now, the reason for this is because I'm going to make a really terrible analogy here, and, and I hope it works. For those of you guys who are Dragon Ball Z fans, you guys know that in the younger days of the series, Gohan was like this character where it's like every once in a while, something will happen, he'll just lose his shit, and his power will just fly off the charts for a temporary amount of time. That's what happens with the Incredible Hulk here. His World Breaker form, or at least the, the super angry, you know, unstoppable force Incredible Hulk, doesn't really come until like the very end of the story. But right now, he's still like insanely stronger than he's ever been before. He's well beyond the limits that he's been at previously in his publication history. But as he's fighting Tony Stark, he begins to have these flashbacks to the time that he spent with Kyra. He begins to have flashbacks to the love that he felt for her, to the fact that he was going to be a father, and to the you know imminent destruction of Kyra when the bomb went off. And this just sends him right over the edge. It really kind of like rejuvenates this anger that he has. And he immediately takes it to Tony Stark and starts ripping his... Uh, his, his Hulkbuster armor apart. Now, this is why I say the whole the, the World War Hulk storyline is so cool, because under normal circumstances, if Tony Stark were to go against the Incredible Hulk with his Hulkbuster armor, he'd be able to hold out the Hulk long enough that either Banner would just lose interest and walk away, or he would just not really tire out, but it would allow other heroes to come into the fray and talk, you know, the Incredible Hulk down, or it would allow the situation to be resolved without a massive amount of destruction. That's not the case here. The Hulk just keeps getting angrier and angrier and angrier, and Tony Stark just keeps pissing him off more and more and more until it gets to the point that the Incredible Hulk has effectively destroyed Tony Stark's Hulkbuster armor and just kind of left Tony Stark there on his own to figure out what in the hell he's going to do. Not only that, it allows the Incredible Hulk to take Tony Stark prisoner as his first, or I guess his second victim in his campaign to take out the Illuminati as part of the Earth's superhero roster. So continuing our coverage of World War Hulk in this video, we're going to focus on the Incredible Hulk fighting all the X-Men. And when I say all the X-Men, I mean all the X-Men. Every last one. Now, this is actually a really, really, really cool set of events. So the reason why is because it's just the Hulk fighting every single X-Men. <laughs> <laughs> How does it get cooler than that? The issue with this is that this story, as far as I've been able to tell, is a little ambiguous on where it stands. Of course, we know that it's around the time that the Incredible Hulk shows up on Earth, but we don't know if it is before he fights Tony Stark, if it's after he fights Tony Stark, at least I haven't been able to figure that out yet. But it happens around the first issue, so that's that's really good enough. Besides, it's just the Incredible Hulk beating up X-Men. We can just kind of guess when it takes place. But what this does is this initially picks up with Tony Stark meeting with Charles Xavier prior to his conflict with the Incredible Hulk in the first issue. Now, the kicker to this is that Charles Xavier was not present during the events of the Illuminati kicking Bruce Banner off the face of the planet Earth and sending him off to the events that would lead into Planet Hulk. Instead, this was after the events of House of M. And so, you know, at this point in time, Charles Xavier was still missing in action. No one really knew where he was. And so because he wasn't part of these events, he never made a conscious decision. Now, initially, Tony Stark asked him this. Tony Stark says, hey man, look, like, here's what's going on. Like, I'm just gonna brief you because you're part of the Illuminati. You need to know what's going on. But his other question is, if you had to have made a choice, if you had to have chosen whether or not to banish the Hulk, which choice would you have made? Now, Charles Xavier doesn't initially answer him. Instead, we just basically pick up with the present day. Now, what this does, or at least what, what this opening tie-in does uh, initially, at least by uh, Christos Gage, the way that he does it, is it just focuses largely on Charles Xavier just kind of reminding us, or at the very least Christos Gage reminding us, where things stand in the mutant community. Now, on the surface, this wouldn't really seem necessary, but a, a comic book that's... That 
that basically centers on the Incredible Hulk fighting the X-Men would draw attention no matter where people were in the realm of their understanding of comics. And so the great thing about this is that it almost treats it like a self-contained story to a degree in the sense that it refreshes people with where the X-Men are at if they haven't read anything about the X-Men up to this point. Now again, after the events of House of M, we know that the Scarlet Witch's actions were on a multiversal level in the sense that she had stripped 98% of the mutant population of their powers across the multiverse, not just the main Marvel Universe. And so because of this, after the events of House of M, there were no mutants being born. This is the reason why the birth of Hope Summers was such a big deal in the Marvel timeline because we'd never seen any new mutants being born after House of M. Instead, there was just a massive reduction and then the numbers just seemed to stop there. And so again, you know, with, with, the, with the idea of the mutant population being reduced down to 198 in total, plus a few who have died here and there over the course of the events between House of M and this uh, and World War Hulk right now, uh, this is really just a scenario where they're all being not really held prisoner, but they're all being guarded by sentinels to, within the confines of the Xavier Mansion. However, almost immediately after we pick up with this little bit of a story, we suddenly have, you know, the Incredible Hulk showing up in front of Xavier Mansion. Now, the first thing he says is, I want Charles Xavier. Like, I want Charles Xavier out here right now. You know, I want him, I want to talk to him. Now, we're actually going to learn the Incredible Hulk doesn't intend to kill Charles Xavier or even to beat him extremely bad. Instead, like, he's showing up here because he has questions that he wants answered. But the kicker is that, you know, you have the, the sub roster, like the minor X-Men that honestly, uh, most people don't really care about, you know, who are here right now. And they're, they're the ones that are just kind of hanging out, you know, with Charles Xavier. But Beast tells him, look, man, you got to get out of here. Like, we're, we cannot bring you Charles Xavier. That's not going to happen. Now, this is actually pretty important because Beast has a long standing history with the Incredible Hulk. I wouldn't go as far as to say that they're like the best of friends ever, but there is a lot of respect between the two of them because Bruce Banner's a scientist, Beast is a scientist. They share a common ground in terms of their overall uh, interests and views. And there's been a multitude of times where they've reached uh, reached across the aisle and talked to one another in order to sort out various problems that they couldn't do on their own. The problem with this is that the Incredible Hulk has no interest in past friendships. The Incredible Hulk has no interest in past allies. Instead, he just simply sends Hank McCoy flying along his way and almost knocks him out. In response to this, the X-Men essentially jump in as best they can. Now, somebody else who's kind of sitting on the sidelines here is Joshua Foley. Now, Joshua Foley is an Omega level mutant. He's really, really powerful within the confines of his abilities. The problem is that his abilities are not in the realm of, you know, telekinesis or telepathy. You know, he's not an Omega level energy projector or anything like that. He's a kid that can basically uh, control the biological structure of other people's bodies, but only in so far as how it's confined to healing. So he can heal from anything and he can heal others from anything. He's effectively immortal. The issue with this is that the, the plan of Beast is to basically send the healing factor of the Incredible Hulk into overdrive. But the reason why I say this is an issue is because the Incredible Hulk is an uncharted levels of power here, even for his character. The X-Men have never faced a foe on the level of Incredible Hulk when it comes to sheer strength and durability. They faced wildly powerful beings, but we're talking about beings with the ability to warp reality, stuff like that. But the Incredible Hulk is a tangible threat that cannot be stopped. The closest that we ever really got to the X-Men associating with someone like this would be like Eighth Day Juggernaut. But Eighth Day Juggernaut, that's, like some, that's something we'll talk about here in a little bit when the Juggernaut shows up. But Eighth Day Juggernaut was not on the same level as World Breaker Hulk. Um, they were close, but Eighth Day Juggernaut would probably still be defeated by World Breaker Hulk. It actually creates a pretty cool discussion, a pretty cool debate. Eighth Day Juggernaut. I'm curious, who do you think would win? Eighth Day Juggernaut or the Incredible Hulk? I'll run over what Eighth Day Juggernaut is here in a minute. But for right now, um, it's really just these X-Men doing what they can to face off against the Hulk. But in truth, I mean, this is the B roster. You know, these guys have no chance. Now, the cool thing here is we actually get to see Laura Kenny fight. Now, Laura Kenny, of course, X-23, I have a, a character, I have a videos on her. For those of you guys who don't know, X-23 was cloned or designed to be a clone of Wolverine, but they had to modify her genes to make her a woman instead of a guy, simply because of the fact that the chromosomes used to create her were corrupted to a degree, and so they were just kind of stuck with uh, with making her a female. But she's every ounce as capable as Wolverine is in the, in the sense that she has adamantium claws, in the sense that she is a prodigious fighter. Uh, she was trained to be an assassin. She has enhanced healing, all the same features as Wolverine. It's just a different characteristic of her in terms of who she is and the backstory is different. But the idea here is that while she does have the same kind of fighting ability as Wolverine, she doesn't have the same experience. And that's what that's what makes a whole different thing. Now, she is capable because she's assassinated people. She's been in a lot of different conflicts, but she's never gone toe to toe with the Incredible Hulk. Wolverine has. Logan has gone against the Incredible Hulk in a multitude of occasions. And so he knows how to engage the Hulk effectively. And this proves itself in the fact that X-23 has no chance here. I mean, she has adamantium. She manages to scrape his face, but the Incredible Hulk grabs her and just throws her into a wall. And that's that, you know,
know, that she's she has nothing to offer in this situation. And so again, from here, it's really just the Incredible Hulk turning his attention to everyone he can find until we get the A roster of the X-Men showing up. And this is Wolverine, this is Cyclops, Emma Frost, uh, Colossus, Kitty Pride. Colossus is actually a really cool situation in this fight too. It's really, really funny what happens. I mean, it's not funny what happens to him, but it's 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 kind of funny. <laughs> it's kind of funny. Like it's it's cool. But the idea here is that Charles Xavier says, okay, fine, you know, look, the Incredible Hulk didn't show up here for no reason. All right, it's not like he's just on a rampage. You know, we know he's demanding members of the Illuminati. Again, the X-Men don't know about the Illuminati, but in the mind of Charles Xavier, he's like, he's he's demanding my fellow members of the Illuminati. It has something to do with what they made. This, com you know, combined with what it was that Tony Stark told me indicates the Incredible Hulk has come back here to unleash hell on us all. He's come back here to, to destroy us as the Illuminati. And so what we do here is we transition with, uh, you know, Charles Xavier as he goes through and begins scanning the mind of uh, of the Incredible Hulk. Now, what's funny about this is Charles Xavier tells us that in years past, it's never been insanely difficult to scan the mind of the Incredible Hulk. It was always relatively difficult because the Hulk's mind was really more of a primal force, more so than inaccessible or something like that. But the idea here is that the Incredible Hulk is filled with so much rage right now that it's almost created its own self-sustaining barrier against the power of Charles Xavier. He is able to penetrate, but when he does, he finds the source of this anger. He finds out the Incredible Hulk had effectively been tortured, been forced into combat as a gladiator. He had found love and then lost love, and all of that happened because of the actions of the Illuminati. And so Charles Xavier is kind of in a situation right here where he's like, there's nothing we can do to stop him right now. Like, he's not going to be able to listen to reason. More so than that, what Charles Xavier saw was projected into the minds of all the other X-Men as Charles Xavier was seeing it. And so it's not like the X-Men don't know why the Hulk is here. Here now they all understand why he's here but the idea is that they they've essentially come to the realization that there's no talking sense to the incredible hulk right now the incredible hulk is in a state of absolute madness he's almost feral in terms of how angry he is and he's in a level of uncharted strength and durability here and so while the other x-men are temporarily incapacitated he asked charles xavier the most important question he says you know look i know that you were not part of the illuminati when i was banished from this world i know that you know from what black bolt told me you're not here he doesn't know everything about how of him, but he knows that Charles Xavier was not here when that happened. But he asked the question, if you had to make a choice, if you had to, you know, vote, who would, how would you have voted? Would you have kicked me out? Or would you have kept me here on the planet Earth? Now, Charles Xavier does provide a definitive answer here. He beats around the bush for a little bit. You know, he kind of toys around for a little bit, but he says, look, I would not have agreed to kicking you out of Earth for eternity. I would not have forced you to leave. What I would have done is I would have said, we need to remove you from the Earth until we can find a cure. The problem with this for the Incredible Hulk is that there's no real difference here. Whether it was Charles Xavier, you know, banishing him or exiling him until they could find a cure or exiling him forever, it's all the same thing. And the reason why we know this is because Charles Xavier says, look, fine, if you want to take me, you can take me. I will go with you. I will effectively give up. I will surrender. And the Hulk says, cool, let's go. But, but you know, of course, Colossus and the other X-Men step in and they say, no, 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 you're not taking Charles Xavier anywhere. Now, we know with the X-Men, they have a massive amount of respect for Charles Xavier, but this is that in-between period. This is that period where the line of X-Men publications are starting to see Cyclops begin to break away from the teachings of Charles Xavier and start to leave him behind. Now, all of that really came to a head in Avengers versus X-Men, but the idea is that this is kind of the, the rift being formed. This is Cyclops beginning to look away from the idea of Charles Xavier, moving away from his teachings and ultimately stepping into his own as the de facto leader of the X-Men for the most part. Now, of course, with the other X-Men stepping in and doing what they can, I mean, they put up one hell of a fight. I mean, you have Cyclops using the full blast of his optic blast. You have a Wolverine who uses his claws as best he can, you know, of course, to try to fight off the Incredible Hulk here, but none of them are really able to do anything to hold their own. Emma Frost even goes as far as to say, hey, look, I'm joining the fight here. You know, my my daughters, you know, my clones, more or less, the Step for Cuckoos, are monitoring the entire fight. And so if you try to step in and stop us from fighting, we'll shut your mind down. And so it's really her saying, go in and tend to the wounded. Do not get in the way. Now, again, this is, of course, you know, just the idea that they're breaking away. I mean, again, you know, after the events of House of M, during the Decimation storyline, when Charles Xavier was absentee, it was really left to Emma Frost and to Cyclops to run the X-Men team. And so in their mind, Charles Xavier is now an unessential 
part of the X-Men roster. They've really proven they can run it without him. They don't really need him. His return is welcomed, but his return is also somewhat inconvenient for Emma and Cyclops in the sense that, again, they don't feel like they need him. And this is just really Marvel continuing this trend of the X-Men, or at least of Emma Frost and Cyclops saying, look, it's cool that you're here, but you're just kind of getting in the way at this point because all you can do is use telepathy and you've essentially already given up. So you're really more of a hindrance. You know, it's essentially one of those things where, you know, it's like if you're not part of the solution, you're part of the problem. And so they basically send Charles Xavier back into the mansion, which is really wild to see, to see you know, to, to see some measure of respect given here, but to also see a vast amount of disrespect to the guy that literally laid the groundwork for what the X-Men would become in terms of Marvel Comics. But at the very least, you know, because of the story as it goes right now, I mean, this is really kind of a necessity too, because with Charles Xavier having telepathy, there's really not a whole lot he can do. I mean, Emma Frost wouldn't even be part of this conflict if she didn't have a secondary mutation that allowed her to take on her diamond form. But because she has this, I mean, she can step in and she has, you know, a, a reasonable measure of durability against the Incredible Hulk. But at the end of the day, I mean, she's not strong enough to put a, put up a legitimate fight and take the Incredible Hulk out. Now, from here, we actually pick up with Kitty Pride, and Kitty Pride is actually really interesting in this situation because normally we wouldn't consider her to be an essential part of the story. We would kind of laugh it off and say, well, you know, it's Kitty Pride, whatever. But what she does is she phases the Incredible Hulk into the ground. Now, as we know with the Incredible Hulk, his strength, you know, just increases the angrier he gets. And so this is really more of a stopgap measure. And in fact, even, you know, Beast says, yeah, this is really cool, but this is also a stopgap measure. We have to find something that we need to do. I mean, we got to find something to do with him. Now, they initially toy with the idea of throwing him in the prison and the negative zone. Because remember, during the events of Civil War, Reed Richards and Hank Pym and Tony Stark built Prison 42. They built the prison in the negative zone to house those superheroes who refused to register with the Superhuman Registration Act. And they initially consider throwing the Incredible Hulk in there because if they put him in there and they close the portal, he'll never be able to get back out. Like he'll literally just be stuck in the negative zone. But the result is that as they're in the middle of having this discussion, he suddenly breaks himself free. Now, at this point, is really the X-Men sending out an SOS. I mean, you have the younger mutants watching all these events unfold. You have, you know, the Stepford Cuckoos who are watching everything happen. And the idea here is, okay, look, the X-Men can't do this on their own. Like we've seen the X-Men cannot deal with the Incredible Hulk in this level of rage. And so what they do is they send out a message to everybody, to Jimmy Madrox in the uh, X-Factor uh, X investigations, to Siren, the uh, daughter, I think it is, of Banshee, who has like this screen that can disorient people and allow her to fly. They send it out to anybody who's listening, anyone, you know, Excalibur, anybody who is listening to this, or at the very least is aware or familiar with the X-Men, the message goes out to them all. Now, Excalibur doesn't initially step in, you know, Captain Britain, Dazzler, they kind of stay behind, but we end up having the Juggernaut who actually takes his Crimson Gem of Sidorak and communes directly with Sidorak himself. Now, again, we'll get a little more into what this means in terms of this sort of, de you know, repowering of the Juggernaut in terms of Kane Marco, uh, you know, how he normally functions versus a full amount or at least a, a strong amount of the power of Sidorak. But the idea is that while this is happening, the X-Men are just kind of buying time. The X-Men are doing the best they can. Now, Hulk turns his sights to Emma Frost and he says, you're in a tough situation here. And the reason why is because you can't use your telepathy while you're in your diamond form. And in order to use your telepathy, you have to leave your diamond form. But if you do, I have a hold of you, which means that if you get out of your diamond form, I'm going to destroy you. And so it's just this, this funny scenario. Now, in truth, the Incredible Hulk could probably crush her in her diamond form right now with him being as strong as he is. But before he's able to do any one of those things, we have Colossus stepping in. Now, this is why I say things get so cool with Colossus, because historically, Colossus has never been like equal with the Incredible Hulk in terms of power. And the Incredible Hulk's baseline form, sure. But the Incredible Hulk just keeps getting stronger. You know, Colossus does not have an infinite level of strength. He turns into his organic metal form and he's as strong as he's going to get. You know, he, he doesn't get any, you know, any stronger than where he is in this form right now. Now he goes against the Incredible Hulk and the Incredible Hulk even goes as far as to say, hey man, there was probably a time when you were my equal. There was probably a time when for a little while you would have been able to hold your own against me. He's like, but right now you don't have a chance, my friend. And he actually breaks the arms of Colossus in his organic metal form. Now, the reason why this is a big deal is because rarely have we ever seen anybody physically harm Colossus in his organic metal form. In truth, the only people who have been able to do that or who could do that are, of course, the Incredible Hulk in this situation, Magneto, who can control metal, Polaris, Magneto's daughter, who can control metal. And, you know, aside from that, that's really it. You know, I mean, you know, you have like, uh, you have Wolverine's adamantium, which could probably cut through Colossus, but we've never really had a reason aside from, you know, some what if story somewhere where Wolverine kills him all the universe. We've never really had a reason to ask the question of whether or not Wolverine could puncture Colossus organic metal skin. Um, but the idea is that Wolverine effectively jumps back into the fray and begins going against the Incredible Hulk again. Now, here's the other half of this equation when it comes to the Hulk going against Wolverine. In almost all of 
of their previous conflicts, Wolverine was always the smarter guy. You know, the Hulk in their their previous engagements was just raging. He was a guy who was, you know, he was he was going aggro on on Wolverine. You know, he was literally just fighting and fighting and punching and punching, but never really thinking about what was going on. Whereas Wolverine was usually able to outpace him, he was able to dance around him, he was able to get past him, whatever it is he needed to do. With the Incredible Hulk in this situation right now, he's he's a thinking machine. I mean, he's a guy that's got the full faculties of his normal self. He's able to think on you know a normal way than he than he usually is. And so because of this, he asked the question: Well, if I can't break your you know adamantium skeleton, if I can't destroy that inside your adamantium skeleton, are the same fluids and the same marrows as a normal person has. But he says the adamantium skeleton also houses your brain. So here's the question: If I start smashing your head against the ground as hard as I can, and your brain starts smashing against the side of your skull, what's going to happen? And he says, let's find out. And so he just starts smashing his head into the ground. And it's cool. It's because it's, it's something that we've never really seen the Incredible Hulk sit down and think about before. And that's one of the reasons why the World War Hulk story works out so well is because it's a really intelligent Incredible Hulk at the absolute peak of his strength going against some of the most formidable heroes in the history of Marvel Comics. And so it just comes out awesome. Now from here, we pick up with the arrival of Juggernaut. And this is not a fully powered Kane Marco, not even, you know, not even by 50%. And this is shown in the fact that as soon as he arrives and he tries to go against the Hulk, the Hulk just takes him out immediately. I mean, he's just like, get out of here, down for the count. And so we basically pick up with whoever's left. I mean, we have different people like Strong Guy, we have Wolfsbane, we have Nightcrawler, Warpath, you know, we have Jimmy Madrox, we even have Darwin. And this is actually a really cool situation because Darwin is an Omega level mutant, but his mutant power is basically to allow his body to do whatever it needs to do for him to survive a situation. So he's like the extreme example of a survivalist. Now, when they arrive here, again, it's much like before. They start going through and they all start trying to take the Incredible Hulk out. Now, the cool thing is that none of them are really able to do it. I mean, Strong Guy and Warpath are the only ones that have the power to really pull this off. Darwin, with his ability to, you know, again, alter his body's structure, his body automatically altering its structure in order to ensure his survival, basically redesigns or restructures itself in a way to where he can start absorbing gamma radiation. Now, the idea here is that because the Incredible Hulk himself is powered by gamma radiation, it's essentially a scenario where he's he's operating much like a battery. Under normal circumstances, the Incredible Hulk can be exhausted. The Incredible Hulk's, you know, gamma radiation can be siphoned off to a point where he becomes incredibly exhausted and just reverts back to his banner form. It's happened in a multitude of times in Marvel Comics. The issue with this is that because of the fact that the Incredible Hulk is so angry, he's virtually limitless right now. There is no end to his reservoir of gamma radiation. And so as Darwin siphons it off, more just keeps coming and coming and coming. And so ultimately, there's nothing he can do here. And in fact, his body actually comes to the realization that he can't stop the Incredible Hulk. And so instead of taking on some kind of mutation, like, you know, infinite strength or something like that, instead, Darwin's body just teleports him out of there. And that's it. <laughs> and it's a really funny, funny, funny scenario because, you know, Nightcrawler comments on this. He's like, well, I mean, if Darwin's body allows him to survive any situation and Darwin left, his body teleported him away. Well, then it's obvious the only way to survive the situation is to not be here. Now, at this point, we switch over to Strong Guy. Now, Strong Guy has a long running history in the realm of Marvel Comics. He's not new, not by any stretch of the imagination. He's been in, I guess, part of the X Factor with the uh, second iteration after Louis Simonson and Walter Simonson left. So he's like the 90s X Factor when they were essentially a government sanctioned superhero team. But Strong Guy's powers are almost, uh, or I guess, almost identical to the powers of Sebastian Shaw in the sense that Sebastian Shaw can absorb kinetic energy and then channel that energy back out in terms of physical strength. That's what Strong Guy does. And Strong Guy literally, you know, takes the power, takes the punches of the Incredible Hulk and turns them on him, turns them to physical energy and punches him back. The problem with this, and this is actually kind of the weakness the Strong Guy's had for quite some time, is that he cannot absorb an infinite amount of power, right? I mean, he's not like Bishop. You know, he's not like Bishop who can absorb infinite power as long as he doesn't allow his body to overrun and as long as he just, uh, you know, allows that energy out as it needs to be let out. Uh, Strong Guy, if he's hit with enough power, will die. His heart will literally shut down or his body will explode. And so because of this, you know, it's, it's this situation where they're basically saying, hey, look, man, you know, Strong Guy, we like you trying to take on the Incredible Hulk, but, you know, if you absorb too much of an impact from the Incredible Hulk, it will destroy your heart. Your heart will literally just shut down and you will die. And so again, this is really just Strong Guy being forced out of the situation more so than being successfully defeated. And so at this point, we have Nightcrawler jumping in. Now, this is the cool thing because I, I love Nightcrawler. I mean, as a character, in terms of character development, in terms of how he's grown over the years, Nightcrawler is awesome. You know, Kurt Wagner is one of my favorite characters in all of Marvel Comics. And our initial idea would be, well, surely we can have Nightcrawler just teleport the Incredible Hulk away. I mean, could he just like teleport him to another dimension or something like that? But the issue is that the Incredible Hulk's mass is far too large. Now, that's the 
way it works with Nightcrawler. Nightcrawler can't teleport something like, like it's not like Galactus could show up on Earth and then Nightcrawler could teleport him away. Nightcrawler can only teleport things of a certain size or of a certain mass. And the Incredible Hulk is simply just too big for him. Now, in truth, the reason why Nightcrawler has this has this uh, limit to his powers is just for the sake of storytelling. If Nightcrawler had an unlimited amount or if he could teleport people of an unlimited size and ability, well, in truth, he would be like Exodus. But if he were able to do that, then anytime anybody showed up to fight the X-Men, fans would ask the question, well, why doesn't Nightcrawler just teleport him away so they don't have to worry about it? So it just allows Marvel to create some compelling stories with his character, which actually works out. I mean, in truth, this isn't really something that I would look at and say, well, that's just ridiculous. I mean, it makes sense, you know, as, as far as I go when it when it comes to reading the X-Men. But we also have a scenario where another member of uh, of Nightcrawler's team um, had effectively taken off to... <laughs> had effectively taken off to grab the, uh, the Blackwing, X-Men jet, the X-Jet. And what she does... <laughs> <laughs> is she actually crashes it into the Incredible Hulk. Now, this was a two-stage plan between Nightcrawler and his teammate. And I can't remember her name for the life of me, but it's a two-part a two -part plan between the two of them. And the idea is for Nightcrawler to basically move the Incredible Hulk just slightly, just enough that it puts him in the direct path. Because again, he can't teleport him that far away. The other half is to crash the X-Men's jet directly into him for the purpose of, you know, allowing the Blackbird to explode and hopefully, you know, at the very least, incapacitate the Incredible Hulk. This doesn't happen. Like this, this is not what happens. In fact, the Incredible Hulk basically just emerges from the wreckage. Now, this is when we start getting into the territory of the Juggernaut at his absolute strongest. Well, I guess Juggernaut at his absolute strongest is kind of a kind of a misnomer, but when he first showed up here, he was not fully powered. And the reason why is because the amount of energy that Juggernaut can use from Sidorak or Siphon from Sidorak to give him his own durability and strength is relative to his motives. And so what we learn here is that the Juggernaut showing up here was to save, or I guess to protect his uh, his stepbrother, to protect Charles Xavier. But that was a weak reason at best because it doesn't fit into the nature of Kane Marco. It doesn't allow him to give his full self over to the power of the Crimson Gem of Sidorak. And so because of this, what he does, he basically reveals his true motive. He allows himself to fully be handed over and he says, well, my goal here is to just trash the Incredible Hulk, to prove to everybody that the Juggernaut is still the strongest being out there. And so he basically imbues the full power, or at least uh, almost entirely the full power of Sidorak. Now, the reason why I say it's almost the entire power is because during the history of Marvel Comics, there was a storyline called the Eighth Day, which talked about the Octessence, and I've got videos on that and so on and so forth. But Juggernaut was chosen to be the avatar of Sidorak, a being from the Crimson Dimension that provides Doctor Strange with his uh, Crimson Bands to keep people imprisoned, but also supplied Juggernaut, or I guess uh, was the reason why Juggernaut found the Crimson Gem of Sidorak. During the Eighth Day storyline, Juggernaut was imbued with the full strength, the full power of Sidorak, which basically made Juggernaut as strong as he was ever going to be. And so he's referenced as Eighth Day Juggernaut. That's where that comes from. That version of Juggernaut was insanely strong, not on the same level as World Breaker Hulk, but insanely strong. And so this version of Juggernaut basically goes against Hulk as best he can. And the Incredible Hulk recognizes, you know, again, because this is Juggernaut, because he's as strong as he is, if the Juggernaut starts moving, no one's going to be able to stop him, not even World Breaker Hulk. And so World Breaker Hulk says, okay, fine, then we'll just use your momentum against you and literally just sends him on his way. Now, at this point, you know, with, with the Juggernaut running, it's really more a matter of momentum. And so as long as it takes him to get up to speed, it takes him as long, if not twice as long, to slow down, turn back around, and then head back to where he was before. And so at this point, Hulk sits down and, and tells Charles Xavier, look, man, like, it'll be a while before Juggernaut gets back here. And while we're waiting on him, you're going to come with me. Now, this is where the Incredible Hulk basically learns about what went on behind the scenes. This is really him learning about the events of Decimation. This is him learning about how some of the mutants have been killed since the events of House of M. And so the Incredible Hulk essentially, this is kind of a lackluster ending to the story really, but the Incredible Hulk comes to the realization that Charles Xavier views the entire House of M event as his fault. Now the reason why Charles Xavier says that or why he views it as his fault is because when the Scarlet Witch created the House of M, she had kidnapped Charles Xavier and used his telepathy to read the minds of everybody in the world and give them the life that they desired, or at least all the superheroes, and give them the lives that they desired. And so even if it was against his will, Charles Xavier was complicit in House of M. And so because of this, you know, when everything came back to normal and Charles Xavier returned, he looked at the mutant population and said, this is my fault. If the Scarlet Witch had not used my brain to read the minds of all the superheroes and initiate the House of M, the depowering of mutants never would have happened. And so the Incredible Hulk essentially sits down and says, yeah, man, that sucks for you. Like you're already living in hell. And so as a result, he kind of takes pity on Charles Xavier. And in the end, he effectively just kind of takes off and uh, leaves Charles Xavier to his own suffering and his own misery as a guy who feels responsible for the depowering of a multitude of mutants across the entire face of the earth. 
So continuing our discussion on World War Hulk, we pick up with the aftermath of both the Incredible Hulk fighting the X-Men as well as absolutely trashing <laughs> Iron Man's Hulkbuster armor. So of course, at this point, Iron Man is like the first prisoner that's been taken by the Incredible Hulk. Now we'll learn that what the Incredible Hulk is going to do is basically turn Madison Square Garden into a massive gladiatorial arena, not unlike the arena from Planet Hulk. And uh, he's essentially gonna try to force the Illuminati to fight one another. But in this aftermath, we actually have the Iron Fist Danny Rand uh, traveling to Doctor Strange. Now this is a scenario whereby it's basically all the mystics on earth, or at least most of the mystics on earth that still have their powers uh, allying themselves with one another but they also look to dr strange because of the fact that he's so powerful keep in mind dr strange the fight that despite the fact that his power was reduced a bit during the run of new avengers it's still this idea that dr strange could effectively eradicate the incredible hulk easily and in fact this is a point that's brought up you know this is a point that's brought up by uh by by dr strange himself when he says yeah i could i could destroy the hulk no problem like it'd be super easy to do the problem with this is that we have to find another way if i were to banish him to another planet he would come back and he'd be angrier than he is right now because his anger is limitless but he says not only that the incredible hulk is an ally like he has been a superhero he's just simply pissed off because we really just brought this on ourselves you know and so he says i'm not going to kill him we have to find a different way and so from this point we basically switch to the ground level of new york city itself and it's really just whoever is left behind now this is kind of important because within the realm of marvel comics the x-men again as we had talked about have been severely reduced to number but not only that the incredible hulk literally tore through all of them and so i mean they're out of the equation right now like the x-men are not going to be part of the situation now, this is greg pack effectively just kind of dwindling everything down to the point where only one hero is capable of going toe-to-toe -to -toe with the incredible hulk we of course know that that's the century but the idea is to also take what's left of the avengers carol danvers doc samson spider-man uh spider-woman luke cage Ares, the god of war like it's pitting them against the incredible hulk and his forces in an effort to try to take them out i mean she hulk's here but this is this is crazy because she hulk is one of the only characters in marvel comics that is as familiar with gamma radiation or at least as relatively familiar with gamma radiation as the incredible hulk is because she received a blood transfusion from bruce banner and so the reason why this matters is that once banner you know once she takes on the incredible hulk as the only person that can really go toe-to-toe -to -toe with his strength or at least it's believed that she can he takes her out with the greatest of ease in fact she gives him a blunt force punch to the face and nothing happens and so when he takes her out so quickly you know without ever really breaking a sweat she simply says god help us now on the surface this doesn't really seem relevant but in the greater story it's monumental because this is effectively she hulk saying we're fighting a losing war like we cannot win like even if we were to defeat his warbound even if we were to beat you know were to beat korg and eloe and hero the shame even if we were to take all them out it wouldn't matter because then we've got to deal with big papa hulk <laughs> and he ain't taking no prisoners well i guess he is taking prisoners but but the idea here is that he he could literally just take on the entirety of our superheroes we saw that in the what if story where he killed them all and so i mean it's 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 not like they have a legitimate chance this is also kind of funny here because this is also greg pack showing us just how strong the incredible hulk is i mean you know doc samson is strong in terms of his strength i mean he's he's very formidable she hulk's formidable as well and so are carol dammers i mean these are kind of like the powerhouses Ares, the god of war these are just some of the strongest people now one thing to keep in mind this is something that i want you to bear in mind too thor is not here remember thor was supposedly dead before the events of ragnarok and so right now he's still in this afterlife kind of thing that's why we don't have Odin's son here right now because I imagine some of you guys one of the first questions you're asking is where the hell is Odin's son <laughs> where's Thor in all of this as far as the world's concerned he's still dead now he actually comes back after this during J Michael Straczynski's run I think or maybe it's the start of Jason Aaron's run I think it's I think it's Straczynski's run but uh but right now he's 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 out of the out of the equation he's out of the picture which is why we simply don't see him here but transitioning over to the Fantastic Four we effectively have Storm of the X-Men we have Black Panther of uh, Wakanda we have Johnny Storm Sue Storm, Reed Richards, they're basically putting their knowledge to task for the purpose of developing a device. They can, uh, at least at least it seems as though, it, it can reduce the powers of the Incredible Hulk and it can bring him back down to uh, his normal levels. But the problem with this is there's actually a debate between Reed Richards and, and Black Panther. And Black Panther says, hey man, you guys brought this on yourself. I'm doing this because this is a world war now because the Incredible Hulk will kill everyone, not just you. And so he could turn his sights on Wakanda and I would be powerless to stop him. So it's really not Black Panther helping you know Reed Richards because he wants 
to. He's helping Reed Richards because he has to. Uh, but if it was just, if the Incredible Hulk just jumped out and said, hey guys, you know, all I'm going to do is just kill the Illuminati and everybody else would be fine. Black Panther would have stayed in Wakanda. Like he would have just been like, well, you know, what? I don't, I mean, that's their problem. You know, I told them because remember when the Illuminati first formed, Brian Michael Bendis one shot. When the Illuminati first formed and uh, they asked Black Panther to join their ranks, he turned them down and said, what you're doing here is going to lead to some major conflict later on. I don't know what that conflict is going to be. And I don't know what the impact is going to be, but you are going to reap what you sow and a, a reckoning will be coming. Well, this is the reckoning. This is the fruits of the Illuminati's labor. They sent the Hulk away and he came back unleashing absolute hell on the whole of humanity. And so once the Incredible Hulk becomes aware of the fact that the Fantastic Four are still working together, once he becomes aware of the fact that Reed Richards is sitting over there at the Baxter building trying to find a way to take him out, of course, he travels over there. Now, obviously, you know, with, with the Incredible Hulk right now, I mean, he takes out Johnny Storm. Now, this is not a small feat. I mean, this is not a small thing. And keep in mind, when it comes to like energy based powers, Johnny Storm, it's insane how powerful he is. He's effectively the sun when he beefs up to the absolute extreme of his powers. I mean, when, when he blasts the Incredible Hulk, I mean, he's, he's not blasting him with the full might simply because if he did, he would destroy the world, but he's blasting him with enough energy to try to defeat the Incredible Hulk without destroying the world. Now, this is Greg Pak basically telling us if Johnny Storm we're going to try to use the full extent of his abilities. And if he were going to try to destroy the Incredible Hulk, he would annihilate the Earth in the process along with himself. And there's no guarantee he would still succeed. There's an there's a insanely good chance the Incredible Hulk would survive. He would continue living on because his rage and his durability is so extreme right now. It's beyond anything that anybody's ever seen that anybody can ever really withstand. And in fact, we'll actually find out that um, that, that the Incredible Hulk's power is on par with cosmic entities right now. Like with this, his, his physical strength is on par with, with the cosmic entities of the Marvel Universe. And we'll actually find that out through Doctor Strange. But we of course have Ben Grimm stepping in. There's Ben Grimm's like got nothing to offer here. I mean it's <laughs> it's it's almost pathetic. Ben Grimm gets two punches in and then his head gets smashed and that's it. I mean he, he gets he gets two swings and then that's the end of him. Like he's he's literally taken down. Now keep in mind you know the Incredible Hulk didn't kill him because the Incredible Hulk's not there to kill Ben Grimm. The Incredible Hulk's not there to really kill anybody. He's there to capture people. If they decide it's better to die in the process of being captured, well then you know worse for them him better for the Hulk. But in his mind, all he wants to do is take them prisoners. Now, at this point, we're met with what seems to be the Sentry. And this is why I say the Sentry was an important character because he's the really the only character in the Marvel Universe that was able to fight the Incredible Hulk in his World Breaker form to a standstill. I mean, that's that's what we'll actually see later on. But at this moment, the Sentry seems to be calming him down because remember, the Sentry radiates energies that quite literally calms the Incredible Hulk. Not only that, the Incredible Hulk always referred to him as Golden Man. And that goes back to the era of Paul Jenkins and Jay Lee when they first introduced the Sentry to Marvel Comics, but the Sentry's energies have the ability to subdue the Hulk. The problem with this is that this is not the Sentry. This is actually Reed Richards, and Reed Richards had basically constructed a device that allowed him to synthesize the energies of the Sentry in an attempt to calm Banner down. The issue with this is that Banner is so mad he cannot be calmed down, and so this seems like the fight is, you know, between Sentry and, and Hulk himself is basically just, just going to come down to brute force. Who can overpower the other? But with Reed Richards being taken out, of course, Susan Storm steps into the fray, and Susan Storm, I guess, erects force fields for the purpose of, um, of of trying to contain the Incredible Hulk, or at the very least, trying to contain her husband. Now, what's, what's really interesting about this is this is also Greg Pak reminding us where Susan Storm stands. And this is why I say people tend to forget just how capable the Fantastic Four were. People looked at the Fantastic Four and they were like, oh, you know, when there's, when you look at the X-Men and you look at, you know, some of the members of the Avengers and you look at Worldbreaker Hulk and so on and so forth, like who are the Fantastic Four really? What are they really capable of? Well, they're capable of a lot. You know, Johnny Storm is equivalent to the sun and a little bit beyond in terms of his power. Susan Storm can create virtually indestructible force fields that some cosmic entities can't penetrate, that Galactus has actually had a hard time penetrating before. And so it's, it's not as though they just kind of explore stuff, you know, and they invent things and they have a good time and they have a kid that can warp reality. The Fantastic Four are very capable in terms of their abilities. And I love that Greg Pak reminded us, of, reminded us, us of this. You know, I'm, I'm glad that he talked about this. There we go. I can't talk. I'm glad he reminded us of this because it's something very, very easy to forget when you look around the rest of the Marvel Universe. Now, Reed Richards himself, of course, is Mr. Fantastic, trying to stretch himself around, does what he can to subdue the Incredible Hulk, but in the end, he's just kind of pounded into the ground. Now, this is really just writing for the sake of having it, but in response to the fact that Reed Richards is defeated and essentially taken prisoner as uh, as part of the Incredible Hulk's gladiatorial games, we have Susan Storm contact the Sentry, and this is really a recurring theme. This is what's gonna happen in the story over and over and over again. It's gonna be people just pleading to the Sentry, and this is, this is what Greg Pak's leading to. I mean, this is the basic 
thesis behind this is he's saying everyone is begging the century to step in because you know I'm, I, I know I've made I mean I've made videos like hey look Robert Reynolds is is Marvel's version of Superman I mean he is Hyperion is Marvel Superman Gladiators Marvel Superman Blue Marvel is Marvel Superman but when it comes down to it anybody with super strength flight some measurement to the Sun or some kind of atomic energy and you know a cape is a version of, of Superman because Superman was the first superhero I mean he created the standard so you'd be hard-pressed to find anybody that doesn't make anything even remotely close to him you know and people people will say well that's just that's their version of Superman but with the century this does not whether whether he's Marvel Superman or not does not take away from the fact it's insane how powerful he is even when he's not the void or right, even when he's just the century Robert Reynolds and he keeps his powers in check he doesn't allow his you know his powers to go you know unlimited in terms of their abilities it doesn't take away from the fact that the century is stupid powerful in terms of his abilities i mean it's 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 night and day and what this story does actually this is one of the reasons why having him in world war uh, world war hulk was so important is because it showed us the full limits of his power when he is the century exactly what his upper limits are and how far he can go before his body just kind of dissipates his energy and breaks down to his normal form but what we end up doing is we actually pick up with the incredible hulk as he's taking reed richards back to his prison and he's met with rick jones now this is a quintessential example of the phrase and a child Child will save us because Rick Jones has no powers, at least not right now. He's not a bomb, he's just a regular guy. But He's one of the Incredible Hulk's oldest friends. And the reason why I say that is because when Bruce Banner was first exposed to the Gamma Bomb, it was because he was running out to the field to push Rick Jones out of the way. Rick Jones was saved, but Bruce Banner was blasted with the effects of the Gamma Bomb and the Incredible Hulk was born. But Rick Jones was always the one guy who was in Bruce Banner's corner. No matter what happened, you know, come what may, if Bruce Banner could trust anyone, it was always Rick Jones. Rick Jones was always there fighting on his behalf. If the Incredible Hulk was, was taking punches left and right, you know, he couldn't see out of his right eye and he was stumbling to the ground, Rick Jones would stand up, put his boxing gloves on and jump into the fray. Even if he knew he would lose, he would fight on behalf of the Hulk. And the Hulk views him as his real, really like his only true friend. And so when Rick Jones steps up and says, hey, look, man, I get that you're mad. All right, I get that that these guys deserve to have their asses kicked for what they did. I get that they had it coming, you know, because of Civil War, because of the, the ineptitude, because of the stupidity of Reed Richards and Tony Stark and Ant-Man Hank Pym, they deserve what you're giving them, but not like this. They deserve justice, but not the way that you're doing this. And, and Rick Jones says, what you're doing is, is essentially revenge. This is not justice. This is revenge. Now there's a fine line between the two. There's a very fine line between the two. And it's all about emotional state and motivation. But what happens is this moment when the Hulk seems to be vulnerable is seized on by Dr. Strange for the purpose of invading his mind. Now, when he jumps into his head and, uh, and basically encounters the incredible Hulk, he does what he can to go against him, but also allows, you know, various other super heroes to step into the fray for the purpose of trying to take the Incredible Hulk out. More so than that, the, you know, Hulk going against Hercules, you know, Hulk going against those guys, it doesn't make much of a difference. You know, the Incredible Hulk is still able to tear them down. The reason why Doctor Strange wasn't able to really stay in his head is because the Incredible Hulk effectively had to open himself up, whether he intended to or not. You know, Doctor Strange could not smash down the door of the Incredible Hulk's mind. He has to open it up. And the fact that the Incredible Hulk is so angry, the fact that he's filled with so much rage makes that almost impossible. So because of the fact that essentially all of the Avengers have failed, because of really because of the earth superheroes are in like all the Earth superheroes are incapable of taking down the Incredible Hulk in his World Breaker Hulk form. General Thunderbolt Ross, observing the situation, says, these guys have had their chance. We're going to step in. Now, let's, you know, of mice and men is really what this is. I mean, what hope does General Thunderbolt Ross really have against the Incredible Hulk right now? I mean, with all the, the with all the weapons of man, you know, there's nothing they can do here. I mean, if, the, if some of the most formidable superheroes, if the X-Men couldn't take out World Breaker Hulk, if the Avengers couldn't take out World Breaker Hulk, if Greek gods like Hercules and Ares could not take out Worldbreaker Hulk. What hope do rockets and bullets have? But what this does show is that humanity is putting up a legitimate fight, but it also shows the idea that not everyone is okay with what the Incredible Hulk is doing. A lot of people are. A lot of general public are satisfied with the Incredible Hulk for a couple different reasons. Firstly, because they watched the Civil War event unfold. They saw the hubris of some of these superheroes in believing they could control the world, but they also saw that the Incredible Hulk was unjustly sent away by the Illuminati. The Illuminati took the law into their own hands and decided the world was better without a Hulk. Never gave 
gave him a trial, never gave him a chance to defend himself, literally just sent him to the far side of the galaxy. And so a lot of people are very sympathetic to where the Incredible Hulk's coming from right now. But it's also because of the fact that people just love seeing shit get blown up. I mean, I don't know about you guys, but I love seeing stuff get destroyed. There's a reason why a video called The Incredible Hulk Kills All the Superheroes and Becomes Galactus' Herald has a million views because you guys love watching The Incredible Hulk just rip stuff up. But Doctor Strange, again, is doing what he can to try to try to get into the mind of The Incredible Hulk, but he doesn't really have an opportunity here. But finally, with The Incredible Hulk's distraction, with The Incredible Hulk's anger and his rage subsiding, even if only for a moment, it allows Doctor Strange to fully enter his mind. Now, this is Doctor Strange trying to really calm the Hulk down from the inside out because when he gets in there, the Incredible Hulk's mind is a barren wasteland of destruction and death. Now, the reason why is because the Hulk at this moment right now, Warbreaker Hulk, it's not that he's just angry. I mean, he is, but it's also because he's living in one moment in time. And that was one of the coolest things about this. That's why I loved Greg Pak's run with, uh, with Warbreaker Hulk so much is because while he's being attacked on the outside by the armies of Thunderbolt Ross, while they're trying to take him down, while the superheroes are watching this unfold, inside his mind, he's having a discussion with Doctor Strange. Now, Strange is really bluffing here. I mean, he says, I could snuff you out, you know, with a simple move of my fingers. You know, Doctor Strange is full of shit. I mean, he couldn't do that. Let's be honest. You know, I guess he could, but it would, it would require a level of power that he doesn't currently have right now. Like, it would require him to tap into energies that he's not wanting to tap into. That's why I said before, I mean, he could, but it would require him to delve into forms of magic that he doesn't want to delve into. Now, in terms of just his basic raw power, you know, he could put up a formidable fight, but at the end of the day, it wouldn't really be uh, much of a challenge. And so what happens is he says, look, man, show me, show me your true face. Show me what's going on behind the scenes. You know, let down your anger for a moment and tell me where you're coming from. And the Hulk says, look, you know, and this is actually, this is beautifully written in terms of how it's done. The Hulk says, my wife's name was Kyra and I hear her voice all the time. That's all the Hulk hears. He hears her voice when she whispered her honey words to him. You know, he hears her voice when she tells him that she loves him, when she says, this is your home. You know, it's the Hulk living in this moment, living in this time when he had a kingdom on, uh, on Sakaar, living in this time when he had a future with his wife, when he was going to have a child, living in the love that he had at that moment in his life. And then in seconds, it all came crashing down because of the ship that the Illuminati sent him in. Now, this is really cool, man, because this is the calm before the storm. All right, Doctor Strange finally has Banner calm down. And he says, hey, look, we've known each other forever. You know, we've known each other for so long. We've known each other for, for years and years and years. And he says, I know who you are at heart. Like, you do not want to do this. You know, you do not want to be someone that wants to go through and kill superheroes. You know, he says, we fought enemies. We fought, we fought foes that people thought it was insurmountable, but we always came out on top. And he says, this is no different. You know, the enemy here is your hate. The enemy here is your anger, your rage, and you have to fight this. You have to calm down. And so once Banner's finally, finally chilled, Doctor Strange essentially takes him on his way. He says, hey man, look, I've got you. You know, come with me and as friends, we will solve this problem. And Banner says, yep, and I got you too, Home Slice. And he goes back into the Incredible Hulk form. <laughs> What great writing, like what good writing in this story. So he's back to Worldbreaker Hulk and he smashes the hands of Doctor Strange. Now this is important because Doctor Strange cannot effectively cast spells if he cannot use his hands and if he cannot speak. If he loses either one of those things, he's 50% power at best. And so, you know, the Incredible Hulk has effectively crippled Doctor Strange, taken away his ability to be the Sorcerer Supreme. And so at this point, it's just a matter of time before the Incredible Hulk finds him and the Incredible Hulk, you know, takes him as a prisoner because Doctor Strange is effectively helpless. Following that, he goes through and just rips apart the armies of General Thunderbolt Ross. It's go time is what this is. This, this, he, from the word go, the Incredible Hulk just starts smashing into everyone. And this, this is why I love this so much because then we switch to Maria Hill because remember, Maria Hill is really the person running S.H.I.E.L.D. right now with Tony Stark out of commission. And so she's speaking with the President of the United States and the President contacts Robert Reynolds. He says, look, I'm the President of the United States and I'm asking you for your help. I'm the most powerful man in the free world when it comes to government authority and I need your help. And Robert Reynolds is just kind of like, mm, maybe I will, maybe I won't. You know, I'm not really sure that I want to. And this is cool. Now, in terms of Robert's character, I mean, on the surface, that's 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 the case. You know, on the surface, it's, well, you know, maybe I will, maybe I won't. He's kind of walking back and forth. But we also know that for Robert Reynolds, this is a very dangerous game. And the reason why is because all it takes is for a moment of weakness. All it takes is, is, is a moment for him to accidentally let his guard down and the void's coming back. 
this this multiversal destructive entity is coming back and it will kill everything. And if Robert Reynolds cannot keep it in check, it will wipe out all things in existence. That's what we saw with Siege. The Siege What If story was the Void just emerging with 100% of its power and killing everything in existence, spreading out into the universe and just causing destruction across all of existence. That is what Robert Reynolds is absolutely afraid of. So on one half, he wants to stop the Hulk. On the other half, he's terrified of what may happen if this unbridled force, you know, uh, you know, fully emerges and comes out here. And so what we end up doing is we, we transition with uh, the Warbound of the Incredible Hulk, making its way into the Arcanum of Doctor Strange. Now, what Doctor Strange does here, because of the fact that his hands are broken, because of the fact that he's not able to uh, practice magic the way that he needs to, what he does is he effectively summons the entity of Zom, this, uh, this, this other dimensional entity. Now, this is huge because this is effectively Greg Pak and Doctor Strange saying the Incredible Hulk's strength right now is on par with cosmic entities. And the reason why I say that is because Zom was a being that not even the Ancient One could defeat. You know, Zom is a, is a being whose magical power transcends almost all cosmic entities. As far as I'm aware, there was a story, and I can't remember that story for the life of me. I can't remember what it's called or what issue it was in. But there is a story where Zom had arrived on Earth and had overpowered Dormammu and Dormammu's sister. Doctor Strange couldn't stop him. The Ancient One couldn't stop him. In the end, it required the Living Tribunal to step in and stop Zom and send him back to his own dimension. Like, that's what it took. It took the second most powerful being under the one above all, a multiversal construct with infinite power to stop Zom. Now, here's kind of the kicker with this. With Doctor Strange, he's not going to have the full might of Zom. Instead, he's going to have, you know, a portion of Zom's power. He's going to channel it, but it's just because of the fact that if Doctor Strange were to fully possess all the energies of Zom, at least as far as I'm aware, if he were to fully possess all of them, it would result in his body just being destroyed, most likely. He just simply couldn't handle that much magical energy. All right, so we are continuing our discussion on World War Hulk, and hopefully you guys in the background, uh, those those you guys watching this video, they're drilling in the background in the next place over, and so hopefully it's not too loud, it's not um, you know too distracting or anything, but uh, for those of you guys who join my channel, who joined Comics Explained when we were covering like Red Hulk, uh, you notice we kind of stopped, and the reason why is because I literally came back this week and we're just doing catch up. So it was Planet Hulk, World War Hulk, and what this video will do is it'll effectively wrap back around into uh, why it is a Red Hulk immersed, It'll launch into that new era of the Incredible Hulk under the writing of Jeff Lowe, because again, this is kind of the continuation of Greg Pak's run on the character. I guess the conclusion of Greg Pak's run on the character. And so um, you'll find the playlist for the Incredible Hulk down in the description for all the Hulk content that I have so far. And what I'll do is I'll go ahead and throw World War Hulk and Planet Hulk in chronological order of the Hulk series. That way you guys can literally just kind of follow along with the Incredible Hulk going from Greg Pak's initial run with uh, Planet Hulk up until, you know, the conclusion of this event. Although it did kind of predate Planet Hulk a little bit, but you guys understand what I'm saying in terms of the most notable stories of uh, World War Hulk under the writing of Greg Pak up into the modern day. But in the last video, we had talked about how Doctor Strange had made a pact with the extra-dimensional demon named Zom, who of course was extremely powerful and it required the Living Tribunal to take him out. And so Doctor Strange has quite a bit of power here. And this is proven in the fact that he goes toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Incredible Hulk. I mean, well, I wouldn't say toe-to-toe. -to -toe. He's able to hold his own for a little while against the Incredible Hulk. The issue with this is that we're, we're talking about Doctor Strange channeling a level of power that's so extreme that he can't keep it going for the long haul. Now, with regards to the Hulk himself, what's funny about this is that Doctor Strange almost feels himself being corrupted by, by Zom's power, and that's really the way it works. I mean, we're talking about beings in the Marvel Universe from extra dimensions. When a person takes on the power of one of those beings, that power will corrupt them. That power will alter their perception. It will take away from what it is that makes them who they are and turn them into something much, much darker. And that's what happens with Doctor Strange. The power is so extreme, the hate, the anger, the rage of uh, Zom is so extreme that it actually permeates throughout his entire being. Now, this all really comes to a head when Doctor Strange loses sight of protecting those civilians that are watching the fight unfold as he's fighting the Incredible Hulk. And when he throws him into a building, the building comes crashing down around him, and uh, the Incredible Hulk is actually able to save some of these people. Now, he's able to break them out of the rubble, and Doctor Strange immediately becomes remorseful. But this goes towards the Incredible Hulk's larger plan of depicting Doctor Strange along with the rest of the Illuminati as villains at heart, as opposed to actual superheroes. And this goes to his credence. I mean, when it came down to it, Doctor Strange lost sight of the bigger picture. I mean, he basically became a bad guy. And in doing so, uh, he almost cost the lives of innocent people in his blind rage. And so the Incredible Hulk turns it on Doctor Strange immediately and just overpowers him in the extreme. I mean, he just starts tearing him apart piece by piece. Now, again, Rick Jones tries to neutralize the situation. Now, again, you know, with Rick Jones as a character, he kind of has a lot of leeway here. He's really one of the few characters in Marvel Comics that can really talk to the Incredible Hulk the way that he wants to, because the Incredible Hulk doesn't see him as an enemy. The Incredible Hulk sees him as a friend. Now, in truth, 
truth right now, the Incredible Hulk sees Rick Jones as a guy who's just kind of getting in the way, but Rick Jones poses such an insignificant threat to the desires of the Incredible Hulk that he really doesn't pay much attention to him. Instead, he just kind of considers him as an annoyance, a dude that just goes in periodically and, and kind of gets in the way. And so initially, where Incredible Hulk had the ability to kill Rick Jones, he doesn't. Instead, what he does is he takes those captured superheroes to the gladiatorial arena that he's created in Madison Square Garden and basically says, you're all going to start fighting each other. Now, this is not arbitrary. In fact, the Incredible Hulk's making a point. And what he does before each of these guys, you know, begins to get into the fray and before he subjects each of them to the experiences that he had, he actually allows regular people to stand up and voice their concerns. Now, this is a perfect example with Greg Pak talking about this. This is a perfect example of people who don't know what they're asking for. And what I mean is that under normal circumstances, or I guess in virtually any situation, when things are bad enough, people will believe what they want to believe. And in this situation, things have become extremely dire in the Marvel Universe. And I don't mean just the Incredible Hulk waging war. I mean, everything up to this point, Civil War, the idea of the Superhuman Registration Act, the 50 State Initiative, things before that, you know, Operation Galactic Storm, the Kree Squirrel War, you know, Maximum Security, all these events had just continually led to the fact that humanity was becoming fed up with superheroes as they existed now. But in their blindness, in their anger, and in their refusal or their inability to know all the facts, they make the best decisions they can, but they make boneheaded decisions. And what they do is they say, well, we want the Incredible Hulk's law. Now, in truth, the law the Incredible Hulk is posing here is solving problems through gladiatorial combat. I can almost guarantee you none of these people would survive a gladiatorial thing, but they look to the short term. They don't look to the long term. They don't look to the question of, well, what happens five years from now? What happens 10, 15 years from now? Instead, they're looking at what happens tomorrow. Now, in truth, this is Greg Pak just showing how dire the situation is. These people are so desperate for something other than what they've had that they'll take virtually anything if it's not what they have had. And so what we have are individuals speaking up. We have um, the, the nephew of Bill Foster who was killed when uh, Reed Richards and Tony Stark cloned Thor and that Ragnarok character began tearing through all the superheroes and killed Bill Foster. It's basically victims of people who have lost loved ones because of the actions of the Earth's superheroes. But again, it's just one of these instances where they look at all the Earth's superheroes and they see a problem instead of saying, are there some superheroes out there who were genuinely doing good things? And so again, from here, we basically switch to the Incredible Hulk putting each of these guys through the ringer in the sense that he says when he first arrived, he had to fight these various monsters and these organisms and so on that were on the planet. And he makes them go against, you know, one of these giant monsters. Of course, that monster is essentially defeated. But then he says, the next thing I had to do is I had to fight my own kind or I had to fight people like me in the gladiatorial games using obedience discs. And of course, these guys have already been planted with the obedience discs. You know, Reed Richards, Black Bolt, Tony Stark, uh, Doctor Strange, they've already had obedience discs thrown on them. And so they essentially have to do what they're told or else it'll fry their brain in the process. And so he says, you guys now have to go against each other and fight each one of each other. And, and, and they don't. They don't want to. Well, I mean, they, they have to, but they don't really want to. They're doing it because they're forced to, not because they actually want to. Now, this again is where Greg Pak basically says that people will always become their own worst enemies. And the reason why is because while this event's unfolding, while this conflict is taking place, the people who are watching it begin to switch away from, yeah, these heroes, they need to understand that it's not okay to do whatever they want to, to basically just start demanding blood. They're like, kill, 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 kill. And this shows that people will become swept up in this situation. And it shows the fact that people don't usually think rationally in times of desperation. They think irrationally. And so what we have is Tony Stark effectively using whatever tools are available to him in order to hack into the technology of the, uh, of the Death's Head Guard. Because again, they're basically just machines. And so as he hacks into the Death's Head Guard, he is able to turn them momentarily against uh, some of the forces of the Incredible Hulk. The issue with this is that with Elway using the staff to control the obedience discs, she says, well, fine, if you want to use the machines, then we can use the machines. And she forces Tony Stark to use the machines to basically attack all of them. And so again, it's really showing the Illuminati that they don't have a way out here. I mean, there's not a way for them to just kind of end and walk away from this whole thing. Instead, there's consequences. They're going to have to fight to the death. And so finally, you know, after all this is said and done, with all this being brought broadcast on TV or with Tony Stark on the verge of being killed and the decision being made by the Incredible Hulk based on whether he gives a thumbs up or a thumbs down, Robert Reynolds has had enough. Robert Reynolds is tired of watching all this unfold. He's tired of seeing the Incredible Hulk become so violent. He's tired of seeing some of the Earth's greatest heroes forced to fight against one another. He's tired of standing by and watching all this unfold. Not only that, he also knows he's the only person that can go against the Incredible Hulk and that's what he does. He says, okay, you know what, let's, let's end this. Let's, let's bring this conflict to an end. Let's finally have this stop. And so he takes off for Madison Square Garden. Now, again, it takes him a few minutes to get there, but I mean, well, I would really say seconds for him to get there. But in the time that it takes to get there, we again have, you know, Reed Richards, who's who's more or less being forced to kill Tony Stark. But while this is happening, Tony Stark is successfully able to hack into the obedience discs and effectively force his obedience disc to uh, to be dissolved and allow him to, to move free.
freely, or at the very least, to uh, get away from the conflict. And so, in response to this, Reed Richards keeps trying to reiterate to the Incredible Hulk, we're not the reason why your people were killed. Now, we'll actually find out that he's right, that the shuttle was not a bomb. It was not designed to explode after some predetermined amount of time. Instead, someone screwed with it. Somebody set it up to blow up. But before they can really get any further, you know, Reed Richards says, if you're not willing to listen, then I'm, I'm going to give you one final chance to surrender. And the Incredible Hulk says, or what? And the Sentry finally shows up. Now, this is so cool because the, the Sentry at this point is just unbridled power. This is like the, the peak of his character. Whenever people talk about how powerful the Sentry is, whenever they say, here is how powerful the Sentry is when he's at his absolute max, this is the moment they're referring to in terms of its capabilities. I mean, the Incredible Hulk is on a whole nother level of strength, but the Sentry is right up there with him. I mean, these guys are even. These guys are dead even. But the cool thing about this is the Sentry almost never lets loose. This is not new to the Incredible Hulk. You know, freaking out, lashing out, destroying stuff. His level of strength is higher than it's ever been, but his mentality is much the same as it's always been before. He just wants to be left alone. Right now it's revenge. You know, he's taking it out on, uh, taking out the Illuminati, but for the most part, you know, his experience in lashing out and tearing stuff up and fighting and destroying things is not new. But for the Sentry, he always held back. He always never let his power get to the extreme because one, I mean, he's an agoraphobic. He's terrified of his own power. But two, because of the fact that if he did let loose, there was always a chance that the void would come out. But in this instant, in this moment, he doesn't care. Instead, he's actually relishing, he's celebrating in the idea of just letting this unbridled strength rip through the Incredible Hulk and absolutely just humble him left and right. Now, again, you know, the, the Hulk is able to withstand all this just because of the fact that his durability is so extreme. But for, for the Sentry himself, I mean, he's just, he's, he's excited about being able to cut loose. And he even says that, you know, he says, does it always feel this good when you, when you let loose? Does it always feel this nice when you just finally let it all go and let your rage completely take over? Because again, the Sentry has never really had this chance before. Something else I also want you to notice here, the way Greg Pak is depicting this situation, the Sentry is in total control. He is, he's, he's not losing control. There's no concern of the, uh, of the void coming out. The Sentry is an absolute total control of himself. Not only that, when the Incredible Hulk goes to punch him, this is again, Greg Pak reminding us, these guys are even. Like these guys are on an even playing field. Now, this battle could not just go on infinitely. I mean, if it were to continue on really any further than it is right now, the massive amount of energy that's being expended between their blows, the massive amount of energy the Sentry's letting off would annihilate the entirety of New York City. I mean, this is really like atomic bombs trading blows with one another. I mean, the sheer force of impact from the Incredible Hulk hitting Sentry or, or Sentry hitting the Incredible Hulk is more than enough to shatter a building, let alone lay waste to the entire city in and of itself. And so in response to this, you know, in the background, Reed Richards, Tony Stark, these guys are grabbing these satellites, grabbing all the weapons they can that could, that really pose any measure of substantial damage capability. And they say, we've got to hone these in on these two guys. We've got to bombard them with enough energy that their bodies effectively shut down. Their bodies just can't handle it anymore. And they revert back to their normal human forms. Now, the intention is to launch this weapon, but before they do, uh, we end up finding out that, you know, that Robert Reynolds and Bruce Banner actually just fight each other down to the point that they're physically exhausted. You know, now some of this is because of the fact that Robert Reynolds is just letting off so much energy that is continually calming the Hulk down to the point that he reverts, but at the same time, it's also just a massive expenditure of energy. I mean, this is how hard these guys were fighting. They were fighting to the point that in truth, they were just exhausted physically, mentally, they had nothing left to give. And this is so cool because this is basically, you know, Greg Pak saying when it all comes down to it, these are the only guys when it comes to physical strength, you know, when it comes to just sheer raw strength, these are the two most powerful beings on the face of the planet on Earth in Marvel Comics, Worldbreaker Hulk and the Sentry. They're the only two that could ever stand or they're, they're yeah, the, I guess Sentry is the only one that could ever stand up to Worldbreaker Hulk when everybody else failed. Colossus failed, Juggernaut failed. Sentry was the only one that could pull it off. And so the idea is that with Bruce Banner returning back to his normal form, everybody except for, you know, Hero and the Shame, uh, the Warbound are pretty shocked to see that Bruce Banner is just a guy. You know, the Incredible Hulk is just a regular person. Now, Hero on the Shame uses this as an example to say, well, you know, within each of us is an unbridled force of power, you know, a, a force of nature, something like that. But Meek does not want to see this end. Meek does not want to see the world, you know, the, the world go peacefully. He wants to see all these heroes destroyed. And this is when we learn the truth. He goes to try to kill Bruce Banner in order to, you know, force the Hulk back out again. But when Bruce Banner dodges out of the way, or I guess when he's pushed out of the way by, uh, by Rick Jones, Rick Jones is impaled instead. And let me tell you something, Rob Core. Let me tell you something right now. And this, this is, this is for really reals. All right. Bruce Banner's okay with you, with you hitting him. All right. He's okay with you, with you pummeling him because the Incredible Hulk will come out and it'll protect Bruce Banner. You know what he's not okay with? You know what he's not happy with? 
harming the people he cares about. Woe betide the poor soul that harms someone that Bruce Banner cares about. And that's exactly what happens. Meek impales Rick Jones and Bruce Banner drops the hammer on him. He goes right back into the Incredible Hulk again and just starts ripping into Meek because in his mind, Meek's an enemy now. Meek harmed one of his friends. Not only that, Meek says, hey, I was your first friend. And Hulk says, no, Rick Jones was my first friend. Rick Jones was the first friend I ever had. And that's why I love Greg Pak's writing because he says, hey guys, look, this all comes full circle. You know, yes, Bruce Banner is a force of nature when he's the Incredible Hulk. Yeah, he's, he's, it's an unstoppable force just cutting a swath. I know you guys love it when I say that. He's cutting a swath throughout the superhero community. The X-Men couldn't stop him. The Avengers couldn't stop him. The Fantastic Four couldn't stop him. Doctor Strange, Iron Man, no one could stop him. He was unbridled, unleashed, unrelenting power just beating against the superhero industry as it existed in the Marvel Comics universe. But when it came down to it, all it took was one of his warbound impaling his friend for the Incredible Hulk to turn coat and begin ripping all of them apart. And that's what he does. He just basically starts tearing into all of them. Now, with Meek in the final moments of his life, I mean, you know, with these, these last few moments here and there, he says, I'm the one that did this to you. You know, he says, after you defeated the Red King, you formed a kingdom, you had a wife, you had a child coming. You know, we lived in the crown city. It was, it was peaceful times, but that's not who you are. You're a force of nature. You are a destructive force just cutting through and tearing through everything that you come across. That's what you were made for. That's who you are. You cannot deny your nature. And he says, you forgot who you were. When you married Kyra, when you had a child, you know, when you fathered a child, when you formed a kingdom, when you ushered in an era of peace and united the clans on Sakaar, you forgot who you were. And I set off that bomb and I destroyed the city because I wanted you to remember who you were. The Incredible Hulk... <laughs> <laughs> Wrong answer. The Incredible Hulk, I mean, he doesn't, like initially he doesn't even do anything. Like he's literally just in the background watching these events unfold. And this, man, let me tell you something, people. <laughs> let me tell you something, Rob Core. Fanboy, this is when the Incredible Hulk is at his absolute peak. It's, it's momentary. Or it's, 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 it's a moment in time. I mean, this is the equivalent of Thor, you know, absorbing the runes and becoming the multiversal rune king Thor. I mean, this is, this is the Hulk beyond any level of strength he's ever been, even in this moment in time. All right. You know, he, Meek is killed by one of the warbound, by the brood, you know, that brood species who, you know, is, is outraged at the fact that Meek would just sacrifice millions of people and their own kingdom for the purpose of, you know, jumpstarting the Hulk's rage. The Hulk himself, when they turn around and they say, Hey man, like, are you okay? He's like, no, Oh, I'm not. And he just freaks. I mean, he smashes his hand, you know, he does a clap, shatters, almost shatters the entirety of the New York skyline. And his, I mean, this is just, I've never seen the Incredible Hulk so mad before. But, but the kicker about this is the Incredible Hulk's not mad at anybody else, but himself, because in his mind, he brought all this on them. Not only that, in his rage, he stomps on the ground. Now we're told that he shakes the Eastern seaboard. I would disagree. I think he shakes the world. Like I think with some, with rage like this, like he just, he almost, breaks the world. And he says that. He says, you know, fire your weapons, do whatever you need to do. You know, calm me down before I destroy the world because the Hulk's rage is just increasing. I mean, by the second, it's, he's getting madder and madder and madder and madder. This is a true depiction of the infinite rage of the Incredible Hulk. I mean, there's no calming him down. You know, he just keeps getting madder and madder and angrier and angrier and stronger and stronger. And it'll get to the point where he will destroy the world by stomping on the ground if he continues to get as angry as he's getting. And so because of this, you know, Tony Stark says, okay, fine, you know, on this mark, fire your weapons. And so they end up firing off, you know, the, the weapons on all these different satellites. And in response, Bruce Banner is just bombarded with this massive amount of energy discharge. And it forces the Incredible Hulk back into his normal form. But, uh, you know, as Bruce Banner, this, this really just kind of, kind of rounds out the story because as Banner, you know, he's effectively subdued. I mean, he's not dead, but he's effectively subdued. And what they do is, is they essentially tranquilize him to a degree. Of course, they take his warbound into custody and they end up taking him out to the middle of the Mojave Desert, taking him out to a facility and then putting him three miles underground so that if he ever were to lose it again, he'd be stuck underground and people would have at least some measure of, of notification that he was going to lose his mind. But this right here wraps back around. All right. So this brings us to the introduction of Red Hulk and Jeff Loeb's, uh, Jeff Loeb's Incredible Hulk run, his, his one year long run in two volumes. But if you guys are new here to Comics Explained and you guys enjoy this video, make sure you hit the subscribe button. If you guys like this video, drop a like and uh, leave a comment down below. Let me know
know what you guys thought about Worldbreaker Hulk because I got it, or I guess World War Hulk because I got to tell you, man, it's one of my favorite stories. One of my favorite stories. I think it gets better though when we get to like Fall of Hulks and we get to World uh, World War Hulks when like everyone becomes a Hulk. I'm, I mean, everyone like Spider Man becomes a Hulk, like the whole nine yards. But it's a really, really cool uh, series of events that come out here in the next, you know, little while. I, I think we're going to have a pretty exciting next few weeks in terms of uh, releasing our Hulk videos. But with that being said, guys, we're going to bring this video to an end. And uh, yeah, I will catch you all later. Peace.